Chapter 1 My name, huh, what's in a name anyway? My name is Kelly. Yeah, I know but being the second born and with an older brother, mom was really hoping for a girl. Did I mention that I was born in 1949? Yeah, a baby boomer. I'm now 21 and legally an adult so I can reflect on the past with some perspective. In those days, Kelly was not a popular boy's name, it was more a girl's name. Mom, her name is Brenda by the way, was sure she would have a girl. My dad Peter wanted a girl too, but I think just to make mom happy. I've seen the pictures of me in a baptism dress as a baby, older brother Jason by two years was the same, but somehow mom kept me in dresses longer than Jason, until I was three, going by the pictures. Now this little story is about me growing up Kelly, the disappointed mom, and my other brothers. By 1960, mom had four boys. With the last two brothers, David and Jean, being two and four years younger than me. We were a happy family, although mom had this fascination for anybody else's baby girl whenever she came across them. Then the pill came along. It was at that time that mom reluctantly stopped trying to have a girl, and she could decide because now life for married women became a matter of choice, not just an endless round of getting pregnant and having children. I found out much later that the other reason why she stopped was because mom and dad had a rhesus blood incompatibility and each successive child had a more severe reaction in utero and jaundice after birth. By the time Jean was born, the rhesus factor was so bad that he nearly died. I think it was when I was about 12, 1961, that things started getting seriously weird and awkward for me. This is where my life changed tracks so I will go into more detail, as much as my memory will allow. I will try and reconstruct the events and conversations as I remember them. Some are still so vivid today because of the sudden changes in my life but some less so when things settled down. I was more sensitive to mom and dad than the other boys, who were pretty much rough and tumble. Don't get me wrong, I was too but maybe I just wanted to please and help where I could. The other boys were too self-absorbed to notice when mom was tired or sad, and I could see that her sadness was becoming more and more deep and longer lasting. We had just finished a beautiful rabbit stew that mom made. Rabbits were in plentiful supply in those days and were considered a poor man's food, not like today. Jason, David and Jean all ran off to continue playing in the backyard, a game of war that had been interrupted by dinner while dad went back to his study. Dad was only 21 when the war started and had worked at a factory before the war. Now with a growing family, he was doing night school to become an accountant and earn more money. On weekends, we hardly saw him during the day, he would emerge from his study in time for lunch or dinner. I saw mom stay seated after lunch, she was smiling wearily as the boys ran off, but I looked at her and asked, Mom you look so tired, why don't I help with the dishes and you have a rest? Mom lightened up, her expression going from puzzled to smiling and she nodded happily. Thank you my darling boy, that would be wonderful. You boys do tire me out so and I could use some help now and again. That's okay mom, I replied, I'm happy to help out. I rose from the table and started to clear the table of dirty plates. Wait dear, but you should put on my apron to protect your clothes, go get it for me and I'll put it on you. My good feeling was a little dampened by the prospect of putting on the apron, after all, boys didn't wear aprons in those days, especially mom's pretty apron with the prints of girls in different dresses on it. Dad occasionally wore his barbecue apron, but that was a manly black color with the words meat, heat em and eat em emblazoned on it with a drawing of flames along the bottom. Mom's apron had a sort of mulvy look to it. She got up out of her seat as I returned with the apron. She took it and turned me around, and lowered the loop over my head as the apron appeared in front of me, she then tied it at the back and spun me around. Now you won't get your clothes all dirty and thank you my darling one, I can use a little rest. I turned and picked up the plates, rinsed them off in the sink and put them aside. I returned to the table under mom's watchful gaze, she looked wistful but smiling as I picked up the casserole dish, returned to the sink and rinsed it as well. I washed and dried the dishes then put them away. It was enough time for mom to rest and by the time I finished, mom was up and she untied the apron. She kissed me on the cheek and gave me a hug. Thank you for being such a nice considerate boy. 
I blushed and ran outside happy that I made mum happy, happy that my brothers didn't come in and see me in the apron and happy that I could run outside and join my brothers in the war game, fighting off the Germans who were just behind the rose bushes. When we stopped playing about an hour later, I was ready for a drink and went inside, happy to reflect that I had done a good deed and that mum was happy with me. Hello Kelly, thirsty are you? Mum asked. I'll get you a lemonade. Lemonade! That was a treat in those days, we could only really expect water or cordial usually. Mom got out a big glass and filled it with orange lemonade. The other boys rushed in, seeing the lemonade and asked for some too. Mom embarrassed me a bit when she said, no this is just especially for Kelly because he stayed behind after lunch and helped me in the kitchen. You can have water. They all grumbled and looked at my lemonade, little Jean said, not fair. Mom replied, Well, when you learn to help around the house, you can have some lemonade too. Truly, that is all I remember from that episode, but I'm sure that from that inauspicious moment, my life took me in a different direction. I started helping Mom with cleaning and packing away the dishes every night. At the end of the week, I was given a whole dollar from Dad. Here, son, you were a great help to your mother this week, so I'm giving you a reward of pocket money for every week you help. Wow. A whole dollar was a lot in those days. A fortune for a twelve-year-old boy. My brothers were jealous and soon they were all lining up for jobs to help around the house. Jason got to mow the lawns and water the flower beds on hot days, David who was ten at the time, got to put out the rubbish and Jean got to collect the paper from the front yard and letters from the mailbox. I got to help mom in the kitchen. It was the very next week that I saw a clothes catalog lying on the lounge room table, near where Mum mended our clothes. Next to it was a design book for aprons. It got me curious because Mum told me during the week that she would have to buy me my own apron. Curious to see what was in there, and especially the marked pages, I saw a whole variety of aprons modeled by girls my age and older. Of course there were no boys illustrated in there, it was a time where gender roles were pretty much laid out for you. I flipped through the catalog until I got to the marked page and saw a plain blue apron with no frills or gathered skirt to make it flare, just something plain. I was happy with that. I flipped through the clothes catalog pages where there were other clothes shown. Petticoats and slips to be precise. Oh my. I was only twelve but there was this really pretty girl with tight blonde curls modeling the pinkest, frilliest petticoat and matching camisole. I fell in love with her, she was beautiful but I couldn't stop looking at her in the petticoat. That may have been my first glimmer of sexual awakening. Ahem, I hear from behind as I jumped a million miles. You like the petticoats do you darling? Mum said with a smile. I, I, ah, uh, I mumbled. I thought that I recognized the girl. She looks like a girl at school, I lied. Oh yes. Mom gave me a skeptical look. Do you like the apron I chose for you dear? Mom asked changing the conversation. Oh yes mom, that looks great. I did see the one you marked. Good, I will be going to the shops to buy that one for you tomorrow. Imagine your own pretty apron. Mom, the one I saw was pretty plain. I hope that's the one you mean. Mum opened the catalog and turned to the marked page, it was the one I had seen, I just now noticed the little ruffles on the shoulder straps and on the front pocket though. Well it is the plainest one available. Comes in white, pale blue and pale red. Which color would you like? Pale red? Mum asked. I looked at the pale red, it looked suspiciously like pink to me. I like the blue one Mum. Okay, I'll get that one. Later that day, I noticed as I passed the lounge room that the catalog had gone. I assumed that mum had taken it to show the sales lady which apron she wanted to buy. I thought no more of the apron but I did want to stare at that pretty girl again so I hope that the catalog will make another appearance. That night as I reached for my pajamas under the pillow, I noticed there was something else there. To my surprise, it was the clothes catalog with the page open to the petticoat girl. Now I had to share a room with my older brother Jason so I realized that I would be so embarrassed if he saw me looking at that catalog. I had a lingering look at the picture of the girl in that wonderful petticoat, somehow I was mixing up my feelings for the girl and the petticoat she was wearing. 
I put the catalog under the mattress to hide it better, suddenly realizing that mom must have put it there. What did she think about catching me staring at the picture, I wondered. The next day, Jason, David and Jean were all getting ready to head out after breakfast to explore the creek behind our house. I intended to go out as well when mom asked me, Kelly, could you please help me with the dishes and with a few other things? She had a little smile and what I thought a look of anticipation. I reluctantly agreed and told my brothers I would join them later. By now they were used to me helping mom and didn't really think more of it. I bought you that apron Kelly, I'd like you to try it on, she said. She turned to the pantry door where she kept hers and retrieved a pink apron with two frill-lined pockets at the front. I was horrified. Mom, that's not what I saw in the catalog, and it's pink. No darling it's not the same apron, they ran out of stock, but they had these ones, and it's not pink, it's pale red, she said, seemingly satisfied with her logic. Here, turn around and let me put it on you. Reluctantly, I turned around and let her put the head loop with bib over my head then wrap the apron skirt around me. It fell to just below my knees and definitely covered my shorts. When mom tied it on, the apron wrapped right around so it looked like I was wearing a pink skirt. Turn around, I want to see what it looks like on you. Oh, you look so precious, dear. I reluctantly turned around from mom, catching a glimpse of an expression that looked a bit like a cross between desperate yearning, calculation, and excitement. It made me feel uncomfortable and gave me a fluttery feeling in my stomach. I looked down to see what looked like a skirt with a bib. I was so worried anyone would see me in it so I thought I'd quickly complete my chores and take the darn thing off. I didn't reply to mom, just turned around and cleaned the dishes and put them away. Just as I was about to take off the apron, all my brothers ran in looking for a drink. It was like one of those cartoon shows where the first character suddenly stops and the rest just keep piling in behind him. That's what happened with Jason stopping suddenly with David and Jean crashing in behind. Well, don't you look cute, Kelly. I bet you'd also look good in that petticoat you keep staring at in that catalog you hide under your bed. Jason said with a laugh. David and Jean were younger so they just laughed and called me a wannabe girly. I turned deep red and was about to flee when mom said, Now listen up boys, Kelly didn't choose this color apron, they were all out of the blue ones, so don't tease him. I need his help and I don't want you boys discouraging him, understand? The boys, heads hanging with shame, real or imagined, dumbly nodded agreement. Yes, mom, they said in unison. They went and got their drinks quickly and were soon outside again. Mom caught and stopped me struggling to get the darned apron off. Now don't be hasty, Kelly. The best way to stop them teasing is to act as if you don't care. Keep it on for now and that will show that you're not in the slightest caring of what they said. Aw, do I have to, Mom? I replied. Yes you do and you'll see that I'm right, Mum encouraged, smiling at me and with her fussing about the apron, straightening it here and there. So I stopped trying to get the apron off. Now what's this about your liking slips and petticoats? Do you like them? Are they what I saw you looking at the other day? Mum, you must have put that under my pillow so you know I've seen it. I just can't help looking at that girl, I think she's so pretty. And I'm not looking at the petticoat. I answered, annoyed she would think something like that and equally annoyed that Jason had seen me looking at that catalog. Well bring me that catalog anyway, it must have landed under your pillow as I was making your bed, I was wondering where it had gotten to. And no, I didn't put it there deliberately Kelly. My, what an imagination. So I went to my room, now really aware of the apron I was wearing and retrieved the catalog. When I gave it back to mom, she said that she was thinking of buying some slips and petticoats for our cousin Kellyanne and she would like my opinion. There are some really cute poodle skirts that Kellyanne has but she needs the proper underthings. Sit here with me Kelly and let's go through the catalog, mom said patting a place on the sofa next to her. As I was sitting, she stopped me in a half-sitting position. Tuck that apron under you dear, otherwise it will wrinkle and be hard to iron later. Puzzled, I looked down, noticing how the apron wrapped right around me and I would be sitting on it. I slid my hands under me as I sat, feeling vaguely that this is what women and girls did when wearing a skirt or dress. I looked at my lap, 
It looked like I was wearing a pink skirt with frill-edged front pockets, my bare knees showing through, but not my shorts. And now I was going to pick out petticoats with mom? Mom wrapped her arm around my shoulders and gave me a hug, her voice and tone showing how excited she was. You know, with a family of all boys, I haven't had the opportunity for these sort of discussions I would have had with a daughter. I have missed that. Do you mind doing that with me, Kelly? She asked. I don't mind, Mom. Let's just choose a few things for Kellyanne, I said then added in thought, before anyone sees me. Mom opened the page to the start of the catalog which started with what Mom called half-slips. Aren't these petticoats pretty, Kelly? These are worn when you wear skirts while slips are worn when you are wearing your dresses. They stop your dresses from bunching up. Mom, stop right there. I don't have and don't want any skirts or dresses, so please don't say that I have. It's embarrassing, I objected. It's just a figure of speech, dear, Mom insisted. Before we do that, though, I know that you and Kellyanne are about the same size as I remember when you two were last together, so I'd like to use your measurements to know what sizes to order. Just go to your room and undress to your panties. I mean undies. Reluctantly I went to my room and took off that darned apron and my clothes. At least I had the apron off. Mom came in with a tape measure, pad and pencil and proceeded to take way too many measurements. My arm length just did not seem relevant for instance. Mom, I can understand some measurements but why my arm length? Do they have petticoats with sleeves? I protested. No sweetie, it's just that since you are here, I can do all of your measurements for when I buy your clothes too. Mom soon finished taking down way too many measurements. She told me that if I were a girl I would be a girl size 12. She then told me to get dressed. She selected a new outfit for me from my drawers. Funnily, I had not seen those clothes before. The undies were plain white but somehow felt smooth and looked satiny while the vest was the same texture but had narrow shoulder straps and seemed to billow out slightly in the chest. The t-shirt also seemed strange yet familiar, a pale blue cotton but the sleeves seemed shorter and bunched at the shoulder. My shorts were made of a light tan, almost silky cloth. It had an extra small zip in the front and wide in the leg and cuffs at the bottom and there weren't any pockets. Now let's continue selecting slips and petticoats for Kellyanne. We went to the lounge room where we had left the catalog. Sitting on the couch again, mom with her arm around my shoulder, we began flipping through the catalog again. We will only select those that are available in size 12, so pay attention. I must have sat there for an hour looking at girls' lingerie. I was so embarrassed when dad came through to go to the kitchen for a snack. Mom had just embarrassed me when she said that I would look cute in a particularly lacy petticoat. I had gently nudged mom saying stop teasing mom. She replied by tickling me just as dad walked through. You look like you're having fun Kelly dad said. I immediately turned red, embarrassed that it looked like I was enjoying looking at lingerie catalogs with mom while dressed in the girlish looking t-shirts and shorts. Mom, bless her heart, made it worse when she replied, Kelly and I were just picking out a present for Kellyanne, maybe you could give your opinion too. Dad blushed and retorted, no thanks, I'll leave it to you ladies. He blushed himself, mumbled something and walked through and into the kitchen. My, my, your dad called you a lady. Well looking at you like that, I suppose it does look like you have girlish clothes on, I thought they were more unisex. You could change if you like Kelly. Although if you'd like to keep it on. Yeah, I'd like to change mum, I said incredibly confused whether dad meant what he said and then mum about what she said. Later that day, when I had finally escaped from those clothes and dad had been watching us boys play in the yard, he called me over. Sorry son for what I said earlier, you did look embarrassed, but you also looked like you were enjoying being with mum and dressed like that. I know you were uncomfortable but I want you to know that your mom has been depressed for a long time that she hasn't had a daughter to interact with like I get to with you boys. But her spirits have really lifted since you offered to help her out. Please keep up the good work and do what she wants. It is really important for her and for me, okay Kelly? I suppose so dad, but it is getting a little embarrassing now that she's bought me that pink apron. And when you came in, she had me looking through a lingerie catalog for petticoats for Kelly and Dad, then she tickled me as you were going past, it looked like I was actually enjoying it. You're a right son, it did look that way. 
Thank you for telling me what was happening. But it is important that you do what your mother wants. She needs someone she can share things with and you seem to have caught her attention. I haven't seen her this happy for a long time so please keep that in mind. I understand it can be tough, but it's not forever, just until she is feeling more on top of things. Okay? Okay dad, if it makes her feel better, then I'll help out. You're a good boy son, keep it up, I'm depending on you. I'll make sure your brother's at kept in line too. Chapter 2 Two days later, mom came home from a shopping trip and asked me to come to my room. She had put some fancy store bags on my bed. Hi mom, you wanted to see me? I asked as I came into my bedroom. Yes, Kelly. Remember when we looked through that catalog for a present for Kellyanne? Yes, we picked out some things that she might like, I replied. That's right Kelly, but the thing is, looking in a catalog and looking at the items in the store is very different and I couldn't tell what would look good on her, so I selected some items on approval. I still can't tell what they may look like on her so I would like it if you could model them for me. Mom. No way. Why not just give them to Kellyanne and if they don't fit, get her to exchange them? Kelly, now you're being unreasonable, I'm only asking you to try them on to see if they fit, it won't take long and that way Kellyanne won't have to go to all that trouble. Now come on, I'm not asking for much. I thought to protest some more but remembering what dad asked of me, I stopped myself and shrugged. Okay mom, I'll do it. You will? Oh darling, thank you so much, this won't take so long, mom smiled nervously, yet encouragingly. I could see she was nervous so I thought I had better try hard to be more cooperative. She turned around to retrieve one of the bags, a pink lingerie bag. First of all you will need to get into these undies so that your body has the right shape. She took out some folded flesh colored material. Now go to the bathroom and put these on instead of your undies and tuck your boy parts underneath to give you a smoother look in front, she said. I took the undies and went into the bathroom. Taking off my jockeys, I unfolded the slippery garment to reveal lace-lined full-cut panties with a diamond-type feature in front. They looked way too small for me. I thought to call out that they were too small but handling them I noticed that they were quite stretchy. Reluctantly I slid them up my legs. Being only 12 I was skinny and of course hairless all over my body. So when I tucked my small boy parts under me and pulled up the panties, I couldn't find a bulge that should have been there. The top of the tight elastic panties was high on my waist and seemed to make my tummy smaller, giving me an inwardly curved waist. I reluctantly came out of the bathroom to face mum. She smiled at me as she looked down to see the effect of the panties. Oh, don't they look good on you, she smiled. They really hide your boy parts and if your hair was a little longer. Aw, oh, never mind. Now you know that Kellyanne is developing up there, she said pointing to my chest. I need you to wear this training bra so you will have the right shape before we try on the petticoats. Mom was holding a pretty pink satiny looking bra with floral embroidery on the cups. They were the same color as the control panties that I was wearing. Still keeping in mind what Dad had asked, I didn't protest. Okay Mom, let's get this over with, I replied. She smiled and asked me to put my arms out. I did and she slid the shoulder straps over my arms, reached behind me and hooked the three hooks into the corresponding eyes as the foreign tight feeling across my chest became obvious I looked down and noticed that my chest poked out a bit to what looked like the small, pointy breasts. They're padded so they will give you the right shape, Mum told me, seeing my puzzled reaction. She stepped back to take in the overall effect of the bra and panties and smiled. You look gorgeous Kelly dear. Your first bra and panty set and they fit you perfectly. Mom, they're not mine, they're Kellyanne's. That's why I'm trying them on. I said worriedly. Darling, you have a lot to learn, but never mind. A girl will never wear undies another girl has worn. Since I had to buy them for you to try on the slips and petticoats, they are yours to keep if you want them. Mom, I won't be wanting to keep them. I'm a boy remember. Well, I'm not going to throw them out after just one wearing, so you'll just have to store them in your undies drawer, now let's get this petticoat on you. She had brushed off my protest in such a casual manner, like she was brushing off a dead fly from the windowsill. Mum turned back to the bed where I saw four items laid out. 
One seemed to be a fancy pink petticoat, two were a full slips and the last was simple white, plain petticoat. She picked up the white full slip first. Get into this one, dear. You will need it under the fluffy petticoat as the netting underneath can be quite scratchy. I reluctantly pulled the slip over my head and let it fall down to my knees. Looking down past my chest with training bra just visible, I could see the slippery surface encase my upper legs and my groin area. It felt so weird, the cool slinky feeling on my legs where it touched. Mom fussed over the positioning of the slip and, I couldn't swear on it, but was she purposely brushing her hand past my groin? Now let me stand back and have a look. Mom stood back, she made a twirling motion with her fingers. So I twirled around. By the time I was facing her again, her eyes looked red and watery but she was hiding a smile with her hand. She then had me step into the fancy pink petticoat with lacy edging. Later I worked out it was because she was yearning for the girl she saw before her, not the sun dressed in girl's lingerie. She rushed forward and hugged me. Oh Kelly, you look so gorgeous. Just like Kellyanne as a matter of fact. Thank you for doing this for me. I can really picture what these petticoats will look like on her. Let's try the next half slip. Glad to at least have the first outfit modeling finished, I took off the petticoat and slip and picked up a plainer white slip. Oh, don't be so rough with these delicate garments, Kelly, Mum said. I looked at her puzzled as she picked up the fancy pink petticoat I had just taken off and examined it. Oh, look at this, it has a small rip in the lace edging. Now I can't return it and I certainly can't give it to Kellyanne, she said looking quite annoyed. Sorry, Mum, I didn't know they were so delicate. I looked at the petticoat mum was holding out and couldn't really see where the damage was done. Well, since I can't return it or give it away, you will just have to wear it under your apron when you help me. That way it won't be such a waste of money. Mom, I can't do that, it's girls' clothing, I can't wear that, I exclaimed. Well you already have and you're the one that ruined it, so as a punishment, you are going to wear it whenever you are helping me in the kitchen for the next week. Aw, oh, mum, do I have to? I pleaded. Yes, you do, and since you complained, you will also have to wear your panties and bra as well. So no more complaints out of you. I will teach you how to hand wash the delicate fabrics. That will teach you to respect delicate clothing, mum said in a huff. Then she smiled and asked me to put on the white slip I'd forgotten I was holding. Already dreading what had happened, I wasn't going to add to my new clothing additions. I gingerly stepped into the petticoat and slid it up to my waist. Again Mum asked me to turn around. She was smiling when I completed the turn. Yes, that looks so good on you, I'm sure it will look good on Kellyanne too. Now let's try the petticoat with all the netting over the slip. Mum picked up the big fluffed out petticoat. She slipped it over my head and it fell into place, the top of the slip covering the training bra. I was encased in the soft slinky material, from shoulder to knee. It felt so soft, especially when Mum slid her hands down my body, straightening it out. A little involuntary shiver ran through my body. Mum noticed. Yes, it does that to most girls when they try on such lovely lingerie. Isn't the feel just so delicious? I didn't know what to say, it was a passing shiver, nothing more but Mum wanted it to be more. It was just cool when it first settled on me mum, nothing more, I replied. She looked at me skeptically. Yes, Kelly, I know, but I can tell it was a feeling you enjoyed. But, no buts, a mum knows what her little one's like, so just relax and enjoy it, dot. Mum said. I gave up. Okay, that's enough of that one. Take it off carefully this time and let's try the other slip this time. I was super slow and careful in taking off the petticoat with the netting and the slip under it. Mom inspected them and after a little consideration passed her inspection. I pulled the last slip over my head. This time I made sure I didn't exhibit any signs of shivering or feeling the softness of the material. Oh darling, you're all business aren't you? Just like a professional model on a shoot. With that comment, I realized that I just couldn't win. Now since you're a model, just pretend you're on the catwalk and walk up and down the room for me. Mom. I don't want to, that's just weird, I protested. 
Nothing weird about it, it will give me an idea how the material flows when the wearer is walking, now go on scoot, and put a little wiggle as you walk. Reluctantly I walked up and down the room, mum watching. She seemed to be enjoying herself. Now do that again, but put one hand on your hip and the other in front of you with a limp wrist while you sashay. I rolled my eyes and wanting this over said, okay mum, but please let me go after this. Now go on scoot, mum replied without promising anything. Sighing, I put one hand on my hip, the other in front, limp wrist, and mentally working out how to move, and started sashaying across the room. Turning at the other end, I saw dad looking over mum's shoulder. I stalled. Kelly, just complete the walk, dad said, so I sashayed back to mum. Oh Peter, Kelly and I were having so much fun. She, I mean he seems to be a such natural model, mum said. I can see that, now remember what I said Kelly, be helpful and do what your mum wants, okay? Reluctantly I replied, yes dad. Dad left the room, me feeling let down and trapped. Now that we've finished, I want your help in the kitchen to prepare lunch, so back into your new petticoat and apron, mum commanded. But mum, I'll look like a total girl. Do I hear complaints? Do I have to extend your punishment? No, mum, I said, defeated. Well, just put on a happy face then while you change and help with lunch while I consider if I will extend your punishment for another week. Mum walked out of my room to leave me to get dressed by myself. I went to my bed and took off the padded bra. As I was putting on the supposed ruined petticoat, Jason happened to walk past the open door. He stopped and turned to me agawk. What the hell are you doing, Kelly? Is that a petticoat you're putting on? Ha ha. Wait until I tell mom. He turned to go. Go tell her, she's the one who forced me into this, I yelled, and if I complain, she'll make me wear it for more than a week. Jason stopped and turned around. What, she's making you wear this? Whatever for? She asked me to try it on to see if it fit Kellyanne since we're the same size. She bought a whole lot of stuff for her. She wanted me to try everything for fit. When I took this off, she said I'd wrecked it and that it was now mine and I'd have to wear it for a week while I do the chores. So be careful what you say to her, she's nuts at the moment, she might make you do something just as awful. Jason blinked in disbelief. What? That's awful, but you bought it on yourself helping in the kitchen. So you must like it. I don't Jason and don't tell anyone otherwise, I replied. He just shrugged and wandered of muttering, I better warn the others. I finished dressing by putting on my t-shirt over the petticoat then the apron over that. As I headed for the kitchen, I had to go past the lounge room. I could hear mum talking to dad so I slowed down as I passed the door to listen in. Peter, he loved the girly undies and I could hardly persuade him to take them off. That's hard to believe, but he did look like he was enjoying showing off the petticoats. It was pretty obvious, wasn't it? So will you accept that he likes to dress in girly clothes and let me guide him? Well, I suppose Brenda, but I should talk to him, just to make sure that's what he wants, Dad said. No, don't do that. He also told me that he was too embarrassed to tell anyone that he likes his girly things so if you asked him, he'd say that I was making him do it. He said he'd die of shame if you knew his true feelings. I don't know what he'd do if you confronted him, Mum said. Do you really think he'd harm himself? Dad said in disbelief. Then there was a pause in the conversation and Dad started off again, yes I suppose he could, it would be a terrible thing for a boy to admit to his dad or any other male. Mum followed up enthusiastically, then just react as if it's normal, whatever he's wearing. It's the best way to protect him. I crept past the door and went to the kitchen, distractedly, I thought of what was being said. Mom was setting me up as a, a, what is it? Cross-dresser or some sort of pansy. I felt like it with the stupid petticoat on under the apron, which now looked like a dress flaring out. Now I knew that Dad wouldn't believe me if I told him the truth, Mom took care of that. Despondently, I collected some salad items for a lunchtime salad and put them on the cutting board. I got a knife from the knife stand and started cutting the onion, my eyes getting teary. Son, Dad said suddenly behind my back. 
distracted and alarmed, I turned around, flailing with the knife and accidentally cut my wrist. Dad saw that I cut my wrist and an alarm rushed to me, grabbing the knife from my hand and letting it fall. Then he covered the deep cut with his big hand and dragged me to the sink. Dad, you startled me, it was an accident. I started to explain it was an accident but he wouldn't let me finish. You don't have to explain, your mother told me everything and I want you to know I love you no matter what. She warned me you deny it so I don't want any arguments. You can be my daughter if that's what you want, just don't harm yourself, promise me. Dad, I don't, I started to say, Dad butted in. Promise me, he said with a look of a mixture of concern and love in his eyes. I promised Dad, but, he still wouldn't let me finish. Not another word, let me clean this cut and bandage it. Dad put my wrist under cold running water and to my horror I could see how much I was bleeding I saw two exposed tendons when the blood was washed away. Dad quickly held his hand over my wrist again, holding it really tight and called Mom. Brenda, quick, bring the first aid kit. He yelled across his shoulder. Mom came in with the kit all flustered. What happened? She asked. He saw me while he was wearing the dress and he cut his wrist. Oh, I feel so bad. Don't, Dad, I didn't. Son, don't worry, I love you no matter who you are. Let's just get this fixed up. He took a big roll of gauze from the first aid kit and wrapped up my wrist really tight. I couldn't get a protest in and set him straight, he'd swallowed Mum's story hook line and sinker. Well, off to the hospital, Dad said. But, Dad, can't I change, look what I'm wearing. He looked surprised, paused until Mum caught his eye, then I could see he changed what he was going to say. Well, the apron will protect your clothes and we don't have time. Look the bandage is already soaked. I was hustled to the car and into the back seat, Mum followed, getting in the back seat with me while yelling to the other boys to stay home and not to wander off. Dad put his foot on the accelerator and off we went. I hardly had time to collect my thoughts, stupidly staring at the stupid apron and the lace-lined petticoat showing underneath. Mom was holding my wrist away from the clothing so it wouldn't get bloodied. What had just happened I was wondering, how did I end up cutting my wrist? I didn't mean to, yet here I was with the pain just suddenly making itself obvious. I went pale and clammy. Mom let me rest my head on her shoulder. She began to stroke my hair saying, there, there darling girl, we'll get you there soon, you'll be alright. That's all I remember until I realized I was lying down and I could hear whispers close by. We'll look after him, don't worry. Said a soft female voice, he'll have to stay in overnight and we will need to have him evaluated. I am the hospital psychologist. It's standard for suicide attempts. But Dr. Smythe, I don't think he meant it, it seemed like he was startled when I called him, I heard Dad say. That doesn't sound logical, you walked in and he was wearing a lacy petticoat and apron. It sounds like he was confused and desperate and faced with the reality that his true nature was discovered by you as father, his subconscious took over and he cut himself rather than admit he wanted to be a girl. I opened my eyes, seeing dad and the psychologist talking near me. But what disturbed me more was mom, she had her head turned slightly away from me and she was smiling. I let out a groan, thinking what a mess I was in, falling right into her daughter-loving trap. The doctor saw me open my eyes and groan. Hi, I see you're awake Kelly. I'm Dr. Smythe. I'll be your supervising doctor. You fainted from shock. You're in hospital and will need to stay in overnight for observation. When you're feeling up to it, I'll need to talk to you about what happened before you go home. Just relax dear. She turned to a dial attached to a tube coming out of my arm and I drifted off to sleep as I heard her say, she'll be fine. We'll let her get some rest. Chapter 3 Bang, Clatter, Bang. Noises of a bed being moved out of the ward woke me up. I looked around, it was a children's mixed gender ward, three girls and two boys in beds and I wasn't sure who was being wheeled away as the bed disappeared out the door. Hi, glad to see you awake Kelly, a red-headed nurse was saying to me while looking at my chart. I see you had a little accident with a knife darling, she said as she put down the chart and came over to me. Let me see the dressing, hold out your arm. She looked at the dressing and gently touched the top of the dressing. 
Is that tender, dear? She asked. A little, it stings. Well, that's what is expected when you cut yourself. I see by the chart that you had some stitches put in last night. She looked into my eyes and smiled. I was lost in her smile and didn't notice that she had her hand out with two tablets. This is your medication so be good and take these. I took the tablets and the cup or water, swallowed the tablets and water. Bye for now, sweetie, she said as she went to the next bed. I saw her go to the next bed, it was one of the boys. It was the same routine, check the chart, offer two tablets. What surprised me was that the boy clamped his mouth shut and refused to take them. No I won't, I know what you're doing and I won't take those, I don't want to be a girl like the others in this ward. I heard the nurse reply, half glancing in my direction. Now don't talk such nonsense Jimmy, no one is turning you into a girl, she said just loud enough for me to hear. She continued talking softly to Jimmy but I could tell she was being forceful. Eventually, he let out a sob and took the tablets. The nurse turned to me with a forced smile. He's a little delusional after his recent fever, don't pay any attention to what he says Kelly. She turned and left the ward. I looked at Jimmy, his unusually long hair for a boy falling across his eyes and the light pink hospital gown didn't seem too out of place. What gives with the tablets? I asked. He turned a little toward me then sulkily looked away. I can't say or they'll keep me in here longer. Just mind your own business if you know what's good for you. I was puzzled by the whole thing but reflecting on my own situation, remembering mum's smile last night and how I was dressed when I arrived, I started to worry. Please you've gotta tell me, mum is acting weird, making me dress in petticoats and aprons. That was what I was wearing when I arrived. Please tell me, I don't want to be a girl either. Jimmy turned to me and mouthed, talk later, quiet now. I nodded and was left with my own thoughts and mounting disquiet. The ward clock was at 10 o'clock when Dr. Smythe came to my bed with a warm friendly smile. Now, how's our Kelly doing? She asked as she pulled the curtains around the bed closed. She sat in the chair beside the bed, her tight skirt sliding up her stocking-covered legs. I could see the outline of a lacy pink bra under her thin silky blouse. It caught my eye as it would for any boy. I'm fine thanks doctor. You know I didn't try to cut myself, it was an accident, I added, desperate to clear the air. I'm sure that's how you see it, but what about your subconscious? That's what I'd like to explore. You came in wearing pretty apron and a gorgeous pink petticoat. Could you explain that? How does it feel to wear pretty things? I wore those things because mom asked me to try on some petticoats for size. She'd bought them for my cousin Kellyanne. We're the same size. And the apron I had to wear because I was helping her prepare lunch. That's when the accident happened. So you didn't want to change out of the petticoat when helping to prepare for lunch? Seems you really liked wearing nice feminine things. No, no that's not right, I ripped the petticoat while in a hurry to get it off so mum told me I had to wear it for a week as punishment. Oh I see, you ripped it while getting it off. Your petticoat is here in the side drawer, could you show me the rip? I thought I'd be in trouble now, I actually never saw any damage in the petticoat. I leaned over to the side table, opened the drawer and took out the petticoat. Somehow the bandage and apron seemed to have protected it from my bleeding. I looked and looked and couldn't find any damage. The doctor took the petticoat off me and inspected it. It looks perfect to me. It seems you have created a scenario in your mind to justify wearing it more often. Then you were confronted with the reality of the situation when your dad walked in and saw you wearing it. You were shocked back to reality. In desperation you tried to end it rather than admit your true feelings. No, that's not it at all, I replied. But there's no rip, so something doesn't add up. But I think mum made it up so she could get me to wear it for a week, I replied. As I said it, it sounded so lame and a weak excuse. I shook my head. Your shaking your head makes me think you don't even believe that. No, I think you must come to terms with who you really are Kelly. I will recommend to your parents that you wear pretty feminine clothes to normalize it for you and your family. That way, your anxiety over wearing pretty things will go and you may finally relax and realize you really like wearing them. 
We'll talk about it later. Dr. Smythe opened the curtains and wrote something on my chart, then with a wave, walked over to one of the girls in a bed opposite. I heard her talking but could only catch snippets like, Operation was a success, you'll soon feel more comfortable, and being a girl has its advantages. After the doctor left, Jimmy leant over and said, that's how they got me too. An interview with her, twisting my words, then the medication when I went home. That was three months ago, now my breasts have started to grow. Now they're planning to operate on me like Marcia over there, or should I still call her Mark? I looked over at Marcia, hardly believing that she was once a boy named Mark. I tried to catch her attention and ask her what had happened to her, but she was quietly sobbing into her pillow. I left her alone. I started to feel really queasy in the stomach, wondering how I had been caught up in all of this madness. It really scared me. I didn't want to be a girl, have breasts, and certainly didn't want to wear girl clothes. I also thought of how mum had pushed and cajoled me into wearing those petticoats, yuck. What had she told the hospital psychologist? Just after lunch, a nurse transferred me into a wheelchair and took me to an office. It was Dr. Smythe's office. She smiled as I was wheeled in while I felt trapped with no support from anyone. Hello there Kelly, I hope you are feeling better and had a little time to reflect on what I told you. Um air, I air um. I started to say. Here, I've poured you a drink, it will make you feel better and more relaxed. Dr. Smythe handed me a drink of clear liquid, I hesitated. It's just water, she said smiling. I took the cool plastic cup and drank the water. The usual taste of chlorine seemed a little stronger than normal. There, now that will make you feel more relaxed, I'm sure. I know what I said may have challenged you somewhat and put you on edge, so I'd just like you to relax so we can talk once you're calm. Just go with the flow, feeling relaxed, and calm, calm and relaxed. You're feeling so comfortable and accepting, letting your mind open to my suggestion. My head and eyes seemed to get heavier and I'm sure I drifted off of a second but when I opened my eyes again, I was sure I'd only had a long blink. Dr. Smythe was still sitting there where she was before. That's better, you feel nice and relaxed now, she said. Yes doctor, I said feeling really, really relaxed. So let me get this straight, you really like wearing petticoats don't you? Suddenly, I felt another me take over. It was like looking on through a window to the world. Oh yes, Dr. Smythe. They feel so smooth and silky and give me a wonderful feeling in my tummy. I wish I could wear them all the time, they're so pretty and make me feel really special, I said. Why did I just say that? Where did that come from? But although it sounded so foreign to what I had felt, it now seemed almost a true feeling. My, my that's not what you said earlier. Do you want to explain why you're now saying something different? She asked. I was so confused. Why did I say that? I was still trying to sort this out but I stumbled, trying to hold back something that was coming to my mind, a stupid answer that I really wanted to be a girl. I held my mouth shut, trying to not say it but feeling like I wanted to spill it out. What is it about petticoats? The doctor said. Suddenly my resistance came down and I said it like I really wanted it. Oh, but I really, really want to be a girl. Girls get to wear such beautiful clothes and I still like fashions and makeup and perfume and well, everything about being a girl. I blurted out. Shocked at what I said, I put my hands over my mouth as if I could have taken back those words. I didn't want to be a girl, I know deep down I didn't. I'd never thought about it before and now I was really scared. That's what I thought Kelly dear, under an unhappy boy lies a girly girl just waiting to come out. And you just have. She smiled and wrote down something in my file. But I didn't mean it, it just came out, I don't know what just happened, it's not how I feel, really it isn't. Now remember what I said about the subconscious, it's what you really want, deep down, even if your conscious mind doesn't fully accept it now. But I, I started. Dr. Smythe held up her hand to stop me. Now tell me again what you feel about the petticoat you were wearing. At the mention of petticoats, I suddenly felt associated again and out of no conscious thought I said, oh, I just love to wear them, they make me feel so pretty and special, I wish I was a girl so I could wear them all the time. 
As I was saying it, I could feel those emotions rise in me but somehow were still foreign to me. So there you are, you love to wear them and you want to be a girl. That's why you were so conflicted when your daddy saw you wearing your pretty petticoats. When she said petticoats, I had this sudden feeling of wanting to wear them again and a feeling of wanting to be a girl. I just nodded. So petticoats are your favorite things to wear and you want to wear them all the time, Dr. Smythe reinforced. Oh yes, I said and this time I felt it was true. Then while she was writing in the file, I began to have my doubts. Thank you for being so open and honest with me Callie. That will be all. I'll contact your family, you can go home tomorrow. The orderly came in and wheeled me back to the ward. I thought of petticoats and the one in the bedside table. Suddenly I felt an attraction to it. It seemed to be the prettiest thing in the world. I wished I could wear it. No, no wait, no I didn't that was a stupid thought. I was surprised that dinner was waiting for me back at my bed. But I hadn't been gone four hours had I? It seemed like it was only half an hour. Puzzled I climbed out of the wheelchair and back into the bed. Ow! Why was my behind so sore? I felt a little lump where it was sore. I didn't remember a lump there before. How did that happen? The orderly helped me get settled. He said, thank goodness you're not wearing your petticoat, it will be safe from food spills. When the orderly said petticoat, suddenly I seemed to want to wear it. It is so pretty. No, no what did I just think? I glanced sideways at the drawer where the pretty petticoat lay, yearning. Then with some will power, dragged my gaze back to the food. The orderly had a curious look on his face, then turned and left. With determined concentration, I looked at my food and started picking at it, trying to forget about petticoats. I wondered what was happening to me here, I'd never thought this way before and even at home with just mum, trying on those petticoats for size, I never had the slightest attraction for them before. I heard a whisper. Kelly, Kelly, how are you feeling? You were gone for hours, Jimmy was saying. Yeah I know, but it only felt like half an hour at most, I relied. I think she put you under and hypnotized you. I'm sure that's what happened to me and a few others in here. I think she does it so she can plant the idea in your head that you want to be a girl. Did you feel different when you came out? Yes, it's strange I've been saying things and lately feeling things I never said or felt before. Like when she asked me about wearing petticoats, I felt a sudden urge to get the petticoat out of the drawer and feel it. It's when anyone says that word I just said, beginning with P I just WW want to wear one and be a GG girl. Oh no, she's hypnotized me. What can I do? I asked. Listen to me, I've fought the same thing. It can be done, especially now that you're aware of it. It took me longer to realize and by that stage it was almost too late to fight it. The word she gave me as a trigger before I was released from here three months ago was panties. When I heard that word, I just couldn't help but think about them, think about wearing them and about wanting to be a girl. Of course mum didn't help. I think she found out about this place and sent me here on some phony medical scare. My mum has been acting to encourage me into girly clothes for a while too. Could it be this place provides a service for women who want to turn their sons into daughters? I asked. Shoo, they'll hurt you. Yes, that's what I think this place is. But what I want to tell you is that you can fight the hypnotic suggestions. For me, I tried to desensitize myself to the keyword. I got myself in a quiet room, usually the bedroom and while concentrating really hard, thought of panties, said the word and listened to my thoughts and feelings, fighting it every time I wanted them and what goes with it. It might be your only chance Jimmy whispered. Just then a bed was wheeled into the ward entrance. The patient had returned. She had long blonde hair and was asleep. Jimmy whispered as the orderlies left, that was Bob. I think she's now Betty. Then Jimmy lay back on the pillow, lost in his own thoughts. I must say I did the same, hoping to get out of there before they did anything more to me. I thought about what Jimmy said. This place is turning boys into girls against their will. One visit to set things up, including giving the boys hormone treatments, 
then three months later they come back for the operation. Oh my! Poor Jimmy. I thought of the trigger word idea and how to fight it. I thought I'd give it a go. I lay back, closed my eyes and got ready then gently whispered petticoat. A rush of wanting to feel feminine came to me. I wanted to get that petticoat out of the drawer and feel it to put it on. No, no, no. I don't. But I did. I tried to fight it. My hand crept towards the drawer. I slowly opened it, seeing that Jimmy was turned the other way, the drawer opened noiselessly. I felt an electric thrill when I touched it. I slowly withdrew it and slid it under the sheets and lay it across my legs. The feelings of longing kept building in me. Before long I was wearing it and, exhausted, I fell asleep. Chapter 4 Time to Change the Sheets Kelly, Wake Up Dear The orderly shook me by the shoulder. Her perfume filled my nose and I could smell the strawberry aroma of her hair as she bent over me. I came to groggily and realized that I was hungry and thirsty. It was diner time the day before when I returned from Dr. Smythe's office and being so confused about what happened, I must have fallen asleep. Just hop out of bed for a sec honey, and we'll have the sheets changed in no time. I spun my legs over the side of the bed as she lifted the blankets away from my body. I was mortified to see that I had on the petticoat. I slid off the bed and was about to take the petticoat off me, grabbing the top of it when the orderly's hand stopped me. No, dear, leave the petticoat on, it looks so lovely on you. She said, smiling at me. I cringed a little but the trigger word was said and suddenly I felt like I really wanted to wear it so left it on and sat in the chair next to the bed. The orderly looked at me and said, no that won't do. Stand up again and with your hands, brush your pretty petticoat under you with your hands as you sit. That way it won't crease so badly. Somehow I couldn't resist standing up and then brushing the petticoat under me as I sat. The feel of it was electric and I sat there loving its smooth embrace, loving how it flowed over the top of my legs and down under them. It looked so pretty. I loved the soft lace band at the hem, emphasizing its feminine appearance. The orderly had just finished stripping the bed when Dr. Smythe came in, wheeling Jimmy to his bed and assisting him in getting comfortable. Oh how could I have been so lost in those foreign thoughts. I looked back at him and I knew that he had seen the shock on my face but somehow, he didn't seem to register anything wrong. Dr. Smythe turned to me and walked over. Hello dear, I see that you are more comfortable wearing your pretty petticoat. Again, my mind seemed to take a back seat at the word and smiled. Oh yes, it is so pretty. Thank you for helping me come to terms with my need to wear pretty feminine clothing. How could I have said that? I knew I wasn't saying it, I was observing me saying it but with no control. You'll be glad to know that I have spoken with your parents, especially your father who now knows how strongly you feel about wearing your pretty petticoats. A happy buzz went through my system even though my thoughts were the opposite. Dr. Smythe continued, he knows your life depends on his acceptance of fulfilling your feminine desires, especially your need for those wonderful petticoats I was being bombarded with my trigger word, I felt my own true desires sliding under the programmed ones. Do you have other petticoats dear? Your mother said you had a nice selection, the full petticoats, half slips, gorgeous white and pink petticoats. Oh how I love my petticoats Dr. Smythe, I wish I could wear them all the time, I said, lost in the desire to be embraced by them all the time. I desperately wished that I was a girl. That is what I came in to tell you. Your parents realize now that that is what you want and they are 100% behind your wishes. From now on they will treat you like their daughter, and when the female hormones start to work on your body, you can come back here for fulfill your wishes, Dr. Smythe told me as she smiled and patted my hair. The orderly had finished making the bed and now I climbed back in, making sure my beautiful petticoat was smoothed under me. Your parents will be in by 10 o'clock to take you home Kelly dear. In the meantime, have some breakfast and relax. Dr. Smythe went over to Jimmy's bed and for some reason started quietly talking about stockings. Jimmy's head nodded enthusiastically. I thought of what my legs would look like with stockings on under my petticoat. Ooh, I got a tingle in my tummy. I heard stockings and then garter belt being mentioned a number of times and saw that Jimmy had opened his drawer and pulled out a pair of stockings and garter belt. 
I could see that he had swung his legs around to the side of the bed and pulling off the blankets could see under his hospital gown his lacy pink panties as he attached the garter belt around his waist. He then rolled up a stocking and put his left foot into the stocking and rolled it up his leg. He then attached the three tabs to the stocking. Dr. Smythe was making appreciative, almost cooing sounds and giving him encouraging rub on his shoulder. Jimmy then repeated the process with the other stocking. I could just hear him saying to Dr. Smythe, they feel so smooth and satiny, they are wonderful, just like you said. Dr. Smythe moved between me and Jimmy but I could see that she was helping him smooth them out and I heard the word stocking mentioned more times. I looked down at my petticoat and felt a warm inner glow. Now Jimmy was feeling all girly too. I felt so content. Soon after Dr. Smythe left the ward, a nurse came in and changed the bandage on my wrist. She examined the wound and the stitches. I could see the cut and the way the knife had run diagonally down my arm and not straight across as I had supposed. The sight brought back a flashback of the incident, remembering cutting vegetables in my pretty petticoat and apron, then daddy coming in and surprising me. I wondered why I was so surprised, then remembered having to wear the petticoat for punishment. No, that didn't seem right. I looked down at my beautiful petticoat and wondered how that could be punishment. The nurse soon finished replacing the bandage and said she would leave instructions on changing the bandage with my parents. Breakfast came and, not wanting to spoil my petticoat, covered it with my blanket. All I had was a grapefruit and two slices of toast but it seemed so much, I only had half a slice of toast with my grapefruit. I greedily swallowed my two tablets, knowing now that they will help me become the girl that I wanted to be. I saw Jimmy take his two tablets and swallow them as well. I soon dropped off to sleep. I woke to find a female orderly was pulling a tray near to me. The tray seemed to be full of the sort of things I've seen on my mother's dresser. There were spray bottles, combs, hair clips, a manicure set, nail polish and cosmetics. Hello Kelly, your parents will be here in an hour so I thought I'd make you pretty for them. I felt a little thrill that she was going to make me pretty but again, I also felt a little twinge in my stomach. The orderly trimmed my too long hair which for some reason mom had let grow rather than taking me to get cut. I ended up with a short pixie cut. Next, she sprayed my hair with a little setting lotion and put some curlers in, rolling them under a little bit. She then set me up with a portable hair dryer. It was something I'd seen before, with mom's hair, a plastic cap attached to a hose and a little blower at the other end. There was a strap attached to it that could go over your shoulder so you could carry it while walking around. While my hair was drying, she took my hands and filed my overly long nails into ovals and then applied a frosty pink nail varnish. I was feeling so lost in all the new sensations and lost in the sea of femininity surrounding me. My hair was now dry and while my nails were drying, the orderly took off the plastic cap and took out the rollers. While this was happening, I was told to hold my fingers out straight and gently wave my hands around, the orderly then got some hairspray and sprayed my hair until it felt funny and stiff. I certainly didn't like the smell of hairspray. You look so cute sweetheart, she told me. I hope your mummy will bring you a nice dress to go with your pretty pink petticoat. There was that word again and I so hoped that I could wear a dress home. Just one more thing. You are too young to wear a lot of makeup but I think a touch of lipstick to match your lovely new nails will be just the thing. Pucker up sweetie. Was there something wrong? I thought with a slight frown. The orderly seeing my hesitation said, and it will match your darling petticoat. As if by magic, any doubt vanished and I puckered up my lips as she spread the creamy lipstick across my lips. It felt so good. There you go darling. What a beautiful girl you make, she said. I was smiling at the orderly's comment and feeling feminine as I saw mom come through the door. She rushed to me and hugged me. Oh, my darling Kelly, my you look simply scrumptious. She pulled away and took in the whole new me. Your hair, your lips and nails. They're beautiful. We must be sure keep you like this. You look so happy darling Kelly. I smiled and thanked her for the compliment, meaning every word. I did feel good with this look. I've bought you the cutest outfit to wear home, a pretty petticoat, oh the petticoat is just sublime. 
The petticoat is white lined with lace, a beautiful cami to match the petticoat and a skirt to go over the top, mum gushed. With each mention of petticoat, all thought of anything but being a feminine girl vanished. It was my world. Gladly I wanted to see what outfit she had bought me and gladly I put on the tummy control panties, the padded training bra, camisole and white layered petticoat with pretty lace trim. Hungrily I reached for the beautiful blue silken skirt and slid over my head and down my body until it rested on my waist. Joyously, mum buttoned up the skirt at the back and fussed with it until it hung just right. Merrily, mum handed me a pretty white blouse with a Peter Pan collar and three-quarter length sleeves. Just as happily I put it on, marveling that I was now 100% dressed as a girl and loving it. Mum buttoned it up in the back while I looked down at myself. I could see the outline of the bra through the blouse, the flaring blue skirt but couldn't see my feet. Mum gave me white bobby socks to put on and a pair of black Mary Jane shoes with a two-inch heel. Sitting in the chair, I reached past my skirt and put on the blue socks matching my skirt, then the Mary Janes. Oh mummy, I'm so happy with this outfit, I love it, and hugged her. Looking over her shoulder, I saw daddy there, looking happy but was there a little frown in his eyes. Slowly my smile faded as mum and I ended the hug. I'm happy for you Kelly, and I'm looking forward to having many special times together, mum replied. I'm happy for you, exclaimed dad, you look so happy, how could I have missed noticing your true feelings? Dad looked at me with concern. I felt happy and smiled back but somehow that concern was a seed that diminished a little the euphoria I had felt. I looked at mummy again and to see her glowing smile seemed to make any concern fade into oblivion. Come on Kelly, we must get you home. You've had such a bad time we thought we'd give you a surprise, mum said. Oh, what is mummy? I asked. It wouldn't be a surprise if I told you, now would it? I've already said too much so let's get going. We left the hospital, me wondering why I was feeling so strange in my new skirt and blouse and my new hair and nails. Wasn't this like it should be? We walked past the emergency ward where I saw people waiting to be seen to. I looked at a boy who looked all red and flushed as he tried to keep his eyes open. What was it about being a boy that unsettled me? I wasn't sure. We reached the family sedan and I sat myself in the back seat. It was a sunny day and on the way home I heard for the first time a hit song by Sam Cooke, twisting the night away on the car radio. For some reason, whenever I hear that song I'm reminded of going home, with a bandage on my wrist, fully dressed as a girl typical for the current 1962 fashions, and not knowing what to expect when I got home. I remember my skirt spread out across the back seat and that petticoat peeking out just beyond the hem. It felt so glorious. I remember my folded hands on my lap, pink-painted fingernails, seeing the gleam of daylight in them and feeling the stiffness of my hair as it brushed across the nape of my neck. Feeling the wonder of being totally immersed in a feminine world. Chapter 5 When I got home, Jason, David and Jean were waiting for us. For some reason, they were smiling but not saying much as I walked in. Then as I walked past them at the front door, I heard a little snigger from nine-year-old Jean. I turned to see Jason give Jean a punch in the arm and his smile turned to a frown as he tried to hide his amusement. The reaction made me wonder what was wrong. Then I realized that I was their brother and I had come home in a pretty, girly outfit, my hair in a page boy cut with curls and I had makeup on. Somehow the delusional fog that had built up around me had been torn away and I realized how unreal and detestable my situation was. I didn't want to be a girl and dress and act like a girl. Now I remembered Jimmy's words and how mommy, I mean mom had used my trigger word repeatedly until I couldn't think straight anymore. That little snicker brought me back to a frightening new reality. Suddenly I realized that I had been hypnotized to want to be feminine and here I was totally dressed as a girl. With the realization came the shame of being dressed in full view of my brothers. How will I ever face them again? What did they think of me? In shock, I ran to my room. Opening the door gave me another big shock, for while I was gone, my room had been redecorated into a girl's paradise. Pink walls white French-style bed with cute dolls on the pillow and the side drawers complemented by a vanity with a mirror and crowded with strange bottles and jars and underneath pink cushion stool with ruffled edging. Gone were my sports equipment and trophies. 
For a long while I forgot to breathe, then in despair, fell on my new bed and cried. Gone were Jason's things as well. He was probably moved to the spare room. I heard a gentle knock on the door. Honey, can I come in? Mom asked. No, leave me alone, I yelled back, still sobbing, believing I had been betrayed. I heard Mom's footsteps retreat down the hall. I heard her call to my brothers then say, Kelly hurt herself because she couldn't face you with her true self. It led to harming herself. This is serious, boys. You must accept she is a girl now and I won't hear of any jibes or snickering or teasing. If I do, Kelly just may have a new sister and see how you like it. Do I make myself clear? She is still very sensitive to all of this and may deny it because she is embarrassed so you must help her get comfortable with who she is and don't believe her for a second if she tells you otherwise. The doctor at the hospital told your dad and I that Kelly was really a girl inside and to treat her any differently might make her hurt herself again. I heard my brother's mumble replies. Mom had told them that I really wanted this and now they wouldn't accept my denials. Could it get any worse? Then I heard Mom talking again. If you have any doubts, just tell her what beautiful petticoats she has on, I guarantee she will agree and show her true feminine side. At the mention of petticoats, I started to feel my feminine feelings rise again, felt the soft caress of the petticoat around my legs, feeling beneath my hands the smooth material of my skirt. I started to drift away with that feeling and then realized what was happening. Heart pounding, I fought the feminine feelings. It wasn't right, and now if I deny everything with my brothers, they'll use my trigger word. I mustn't let them know how it affects me. I must fight my conditioning so that I don't fall any further into this feminine trap and started to sob again. How could mum do this to me? I know I didn't want to be a girl but as dad said, mum was desperate to have a girl and now she is working with the boys so that I stay that way. Why did I volunteer to help with the dishes? That, I realized, was when it all started. I must have fallen asleep as I woke up, feeling dried tears on my cheeks. I sat up on the bed, feeling like I could assess my situation now that I was emotionally spent. I also felt nausea rising in me for some reason. I tried to shake it and get on with working out what I should do. I started with looking around my new room. The two soft dolls on my bed with gingham dresses with petticoats and little straw hats were still propped up on the pillows. I was drawn to the petticoats. No, I must try to ignore petticoats. I looked away, yet retaining some curiosity about them. My built-in cupboard drew my attention. I should get out of this girly outfit and put on jeans and a t-shirt at least. With apprehension, I opened the cupboard door, not knowing what I would find. My worst fears were confirmed when I saw a row of dresses and skirts. The drawers were filled with delicate lingerie, stockings, garters, panties, and petticoats. On the floor was a range of girls' shoes, mostly Mary Janes and ballet flats. And one dressy shiny black pair with a one-and-a-half-inch heel. I went and sat on the stool at the vanity and looked at the jars and bottles. There were creams and lotions, two bottles of nail polish and a bottle of polish remover. In the side drawer there were hair ties and brushes and a box of curlers. The second drawer had a range of cosmetics. I closed the drawers and sat pondering my situation. I needed to stay clear-headed, I knew how I lost control when mum used that word so often in quick succession. So I had to minimize mum and others saying the trigger word. That meant that I couldn't give them a reason to use it. That meant I had to show outwardly that I wasn't fighting my situation. That meant that I had to pretend that this was the new me until I could desensitize myself from that word. Then I thought of Dr. Smythe. I had a follow-up appointment in a week. What would happen if she got reports that the post-hypnotic trigger and conditioning was failing? She would reinforce it and like what happened to Jimmy and introduce a new trigger word. I decided that I had to bide my time and build up my mental strength under the radar. I turned to my junior encyclopedia to research hypnosis and post-hypnotic suggestions. I found that some hypnosis research was done on the topic of hypnotic suggestions. Basically, it said that the strength of post-hypnotic suggestion depended on the person, how if they may get lost in storybooks or films, in other words, whether they had a strong imagination, then they were more susceptible to hypnotic suggestions. 
They also said that the suggestions could last for a short or long time but often depended on reinforcement in the subject's environment. That was exactly what was happening, orchestrated by Dr. Smythe and my mother. Now that I was aware of this new information, I thought I had some way of fighting the trigger words and staying me. I sat there a while longer, gathering my resolve to face my family, skirts, petticoats and all. I found some facial tissues and wiped my face. Found some lipstick and with some inner revulsion, smeared it across my lips. I combed my hair so that it looked neat and the curls were perfect. With a deep breath, I went to the bedroom door, opened it and stepped outside. I could hear that there was talking in the lounge room so made my way there. I approached and could see them all sitting together, quietly talking. With a deep breath, I put on a little smile and walked in. Sorry for my reaction when I came in. It just felt a little funny being at home again, but I'm okay now. I hope you can forgive me. Kelly, of course we do, but there's nothing to forgive. Everyone loves you and we're here to help you through this difficult time, Mum said. Kelly, I hope you like your new room. The boys and I spent all of the last two days fixing it especially for you. Mum chose the furniture and of course your new wardrobe, Dad added. I was expected to reply and against my own real feelings, smiled and said, it's a beautiful room and the new clothes are beautiful too. You've done so much for me, thank you. Oh, I was hoping you would like them, we should go through them and you should try them on to see if they fit, I wasn't sure about the petticoat sizes, Mum joined in. Shiver, 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 petticoats, oh. They looked beautiful Mum, yes we could try everything on for size, I struggled to reply and keep myself in control with a happy face brought on by the idea of my petticoat and yet struggling at the same time to quell the warm fuzzy feeling welling up in me. Mum rose from the couch and came over to me, with a smile on her lips. Dad and the boys, although looked concerned, encouraged me with their nervous smiles. I knew then that they only had good wishes and intentions for me, especially since Mum had lectured them earlier. Mum took me by the hand and went back to my new bedroom. The door was still open and as I walked in I could see Mum's eyes light up, finally seeing such a girly room and her supposed daughter in it. Well, let's look at your lingerie, I'll put them on the bed and we can go through them one by one, Mum turned to the cupboard and lingerie drawer and took out a pile of petticoats. I just love the feel of petticoats, don't you? Mum asked. Thrum. My conscious mind reflected on the sweet embrace of the petticoats. I smiled. Yes, I do, they're lovely. I couldn't resist replying. Mum smiled and arrayed the different petticoats on the bed. I tried very hard to resist but the thought of petticoats, seeing them there on the bed made my heart flutter. I liked the feeling and smiled. Mum saw the genuine smile. Come on Kelly, off with the gorgeous petticoat you have on now and let's start trying on these lovely creations. I unbuttoned my blouse and shrugged it off, unzipped my skirt and stepped out of it. I bent down, picked up the hem of my petticoat. Suddenly I felt self-conscious in front of Mum. She was ready to help me put on the pink full petticoat with lace trim at the hem and bodice. Holding it out for me she said, this petticoat is so beautiful, let's get it on you now. She lowered it over my head and let it slip down my body, to fall just above my knees. Mum smoothed it out, sliding her hands down the sides of my body. She stepped back to look at it. Yes, that petticoat fits you well, she observed with a serious and careful eye, and so pretty too. I let the feeling of happiness wash over me, feeling the smooth material against my skin. I smiled and replied, let's try on the next one. While loving the feeling, I knew deep down that I had reserved a special place for my resistance to those feelings and kept hidden the horror any boy would feel being made to wear such feminine garments. I kept up the charade until all my new petticoats were modeled for a smiling mother. The charade however was becoming less so with every new petticoat and every new comment of praise. It was mentally exhausting and after the last one, I begged off saying that it had been a tiring day and I would like to get some rest. Mum relented but not before showing me my new nightie, she mentioned how it looked and felt like my new petticoats and that I would just love wearing it. Mum's comment that it was like a petticoat focused my attention to the nightie. I put it on, feeling the soft satiny material flow down my body. 
Mom had left for a minute but was soon back with two tablets and a glass of water. Take these, doctor's orders, she said. Lost in the feel of the nighty, I mechanically took the two tablets and drank the water. I suddenly felt a little disorientated and nearly stumbled. Mom seemed to expect it and steadied me by holding onto my upper arm. There, there dear, you really must be tired. Now think of how wonderful it is to be feminine all the time and how awful it was being a boy. Yes. It really did feel wonderful to be a girl, at least on the way to being a girl. Yuck, a boy. Who'd want to be a boy? I thought. Mom helped me into bed and tucked me in, giving me a kiss goodnight. She was sure that the petticoat session had done the task intended in reinforcing the post-hypnotic suggestions, making me feel happy and satisfied with my feminization. Maybe the tablets helped as well. I lay in bed, hands wandering across the nighty, reveling in its feel. I became conscious of thinking what harm could it be to enjoy wearing my petticoats, after all they were so beautiful and felt so nice. I struggled to bring back my deeply buried boyish thoughts of rebelling against my situation. I put my hands away from my body, to avoid temptation and thought of the terrible thing done to me. How I regretted the accident with the knife. Then I thought how mum had engineered me into petticoats before it had happened and how she had convinced dad and my brothers how I really wanted this. I found myself gaining ground against my conditioning, buoyed by that thought, I tried to get angry and reject those feminine feelings. It was a struggle, often feeling the slinky material still encasing my body, thinking of petticoats and letting my hands wander up and down the silky nighty. Then I would remember just this morning, seeing the result with my own eyes, how Jimmy seemed to have lost his battle. I knew I had to keep my boy self strong but hidden from Mum and Dr. Smythe so I wouldn't be rehypnotized and lose the battle over my identity. I wondered about Dad's role. He was obviously deeply shocked by seeing me cut myself. Maybe he really thought I wanted to be a girl. I soon fell asleep, exhausted. Chapter 6 I was dimly aware of movement outside my room. I lay in bed, consciousness slowly rising, remembering the day before, how surreal it seemed. I felt the slippery material of the nighty now clinging to me, reminding me of my determination not to be lost to the post-hypnotic suggestions and mum smothering me in femininity. My heart palpitated as I realized that I had to get through this day and the next and so on until I could sustain my own identity without mum or Dr. Smythe realizing. For if they did realize that I was resisting, I would be lost. It seemed that I was more in control of my thoughts and my true self after a good night's sleep. I steeled myself for another day, pretending that I had fallen for the hypnotic suggestions. I heard footsteps coming down the corridor, I readied myself, closed my eyes just as the door opened and the light came on. Rise and shine Kelly honey. It was still dark out, why was mom wanting me to get up so early? I opened my eyes, mom was approaching with a wide smile. Mom was still in her pink nightgown and slippers, hair in curlers. What's up mom? It's so early. Honey, we need to get you ready for the day before the men are awake. You really need to improve your look, darling. Do I look that awful, mom? I forget you are new to everything a girl must do to be presentable. Although you looked really sweet yesterday, we must get rid of that body hair that you are sprouting on your legs and underarms. No self-respecting girl would want that, would they? Remembering my plan, I smiled and replied, Oh no, Mum, you are so right. I'll get up right away. Mum smiled, she led me to the bathroom. Take of your lovely nighty and I'll put this cream on you, it will remove your body hair. I didn't want to do this but as my 13-year-old body had only just begun to produce body hair, it was hardly noticeable. I submitted to Mum slathering the foul-smelling cream on my legs, arms, chest and underarms. I began to get uncomfortable after 10 minutes when mum told me to rinse off in the shower, then to climb into the bath. It was a relief to finally get the cream off, but I didn't like seeing my body hair fall away. It was a little awkward as I still had to keep the bandage on my arm dry, so I hung onto the shower base while I rinsed. I was soon hairless except for my head and shut off the water and climbed into the bath. Mum had put in sweet-smelling oils and bubble bath. I was going to come out literally smelling of roses. After 15 minutes of relaxing, Mum came in and asked me to get out, 
holding a warm fluffy bath towel. I stepped out of the bath and she embraced me with the towel as she dried me. I couldn't help but love my mom just them, even as she was doing her best to turn me into a daughter. I smiled, she saw me and smiled too, then hugged me hard. I'll know we're going to love having our mother-daughter time together, she exclaimed. My smile froze for a second but I tried to recover. I'm not sure if mom noticed but she started talking about the clothing that she had laid out for me while I was in the bath, including the gorgeous dress and petticoat combination. Oh. I can't wait to see what you picked, I hope it's the pink tiered dress with the lovely organza petticoat. I smiled and couldn't wait to see. Mom smiled at me, well you will have to wait and see. Mom rubbed me down with the towel then herded me into my room. On the bed were panties, a training bra, a pink and white dress and the pale pink organza petticoat with a satin ribbon edging. Oh the petticoat is just darling mummy, it will really make the dress stand out, I said and felt like I was sinking in a sea of femininity and loving it. Mom just smiled at me and held out the panties for me to step into. It's a pity you have that funny growth there sweetie, she said as my limp genitals swung between my legs. Suddenly I felt disgusted by them. Ooh, I wish they weren't their mummy, can't you make them go away? I said. It's too early for that sweetie but I can talk to the doctor about it if it bothers you. I know if I had something like that I would be so self-conscious, she replied as she slipped the panties over my bottom. She seemed to think for a moment then said wait there honey, I'll be back soon. I stood there in my panties looking at the bulge in them, slightly disgusted, then wondered why. As I waited, I realized. I had lost myself to the hypnotic suggestions. As it dawned on me what I had asked for, Mum came back into my room. Now this isn't permanent but it will hide your bulge, the doctor told me about this if you ever asked. What is it Mum? I don't want anything permanent. I know sweetie, it takes time to be really happy with who you want to be, so doubts do come up. Just lie on the bed honey and pull down your panties. I did just that, wondering what Mum was up to. She leaned forward and started to manipulate my testicles until they popped up inside me, then, I felt something wet on my ball sack as she pulled my penis back and onto the wet skin. Then she folded the loose skin over my penis and held it for ten seconds and let go. There, that should do it, she said. I carefully sat up, and looked down, my penis and balls were gone. It looked perfectly flat down there, except for two folds of skin going down towards my bottom. What happened? Where did it go? I asked. It's nothing too sophisticated, darling. I just super glued you in place so you look like the girl you were destined to be. Actually, it was surgical glue so it won't come off easily or anytime soon. It binds the skin together. And doesn't it look so natural? Now you don't have to worry about a bump down there. Remember too that you will have to sit like a girl to pee. I stood up. Feeling my skin down there stretching, my penis grabbed tight and cradled in folds of skin. It felt weird but not too uncomfortable. But mom, this is happening so quickly. I said worriedly. Don't worry dear, the doctor said it may be a little uncomfortable for you but he said it would become more natural for you with every passing day. And he said you would feel more natural in your petticoats and panties too. At the mention of petticoats I felt my worries drift away, replaced with a happy acceptance. Mom pulled up my panties. They felt different in that they seemed to follow my new contours better, hugging the front and bottom without interruption. Somehow the look of the smooth front and the feel was comforting and seemed right and natural. Now hold your arms out. Mom slipped my training bra over my arms, the straps settling on my shoulders. She turned me around and hooked the three hooks into the eyes, then adjusted the straps. I looked down seeing how flat the cups were. Don't worry sweetie, they'll grow if you truly want to be a girl, Mum said. I wondered how that could be possible for a boy. Mum then held out the organza petticoat. It looked so inviting and totally girly, I couldn't wait to step into it. It felt like heaven as it slid up my legs and settled around my waist. She gave me a long look and showed me the mirror. I looked like a girl in my bra and petticoat. The petticoat seemed to be caressing my hairless legs and I realized that I really liked it. Hmm, it feels so nice, I smiled mum smiled too. Yes, 
That's a secret for just us girls, she said, holding a finger over her lips. I smiled back. Now for the dress. She lifted the pink sleeveless dress off the bed and unzipped the back. Holding it above my head, I lifted my arms into its interior. I felt the dress descend down my body until I could see the world again and my arms were in the short puffy sleeves. Mom turned me around and zipped up the dress and fiddled with a small button at the top buttoning it though a small cotton loop. The dress would be impossible for me to get it off without help. Mom brushed the knee-length skirt down over my petticoats, smoothing it out. For some reason everything felt better than good, I was embracing my femininity. I swirled the dress around my legs, feeling the petticoat and dress move around my legs. So that is why girls did that. It felt divine. I remembered what I was thinking about the hypnosis, but it seemed so far away now that I was fully dressed and it seemed so silly to be worried about wearing such pretty feminine clothes. Come on dear, let's fix your hair, then we can show you off to your father and brothers. Without a thought of embarrassment, I sat at the vanity as mum brushed my hair into a plain page boy style, pinning the sides back with two small pink barrettes in the shape of delicate bows. Again my lips were coated with pink lip gloss. I slipped on my new ballerina flats and I was ready to go meet the rest of my family. Funnily enough, I was still enmeshed in my girlish feelings and was happy and relaxed as I left my bedroom, mum close behind. Dad and the boys were watching football replays on the television so didn't immediately notice me coming into the lounge room. I stood to the side of the couch for a while until an ad break came on. Then Jean saw me, smiled and said, wow, catching everyone's attention. Dad and the boys all stood up and looked me up and down. Jean reached out and touched the skirt of my dress which rather delighted and surprised me. Do you like the feel of the dress, Jean? I asked smiling. Doesn't it feel so silky and smooth? Dad put his hand on Jean's shoulder and gently nudged him back so that my dress was out of his reach. Well, answer Kelly, won't you, Jean? Do you like the feel of dresses? asked Mom. Jean stumbled for words, awkwardly shifting from one foot to the other. Um, I guess so. But dresses are just for girls just like Kelly. Not for boys like us, Jean replied. Dad gave Jean a little squeeze of approval on the shoulder. Mom just smiled at Jean. Slowly, I was again becoming aware of how wrong this was for me, mixed up still with the feelings of girlishness and acceptance. The niggle wouldn't go away, no matter how I tried to ignore it. Dad and the boys sat down on the couch again as play began again, their attention turned once more to the television, as if the whole episode just didn't happen. Was it a dream? Did Jean just open a window for further changes in the family? I wasn't sure. Mom turned to me and asked, Come on darling, help me in the kitchen so the boys can have a snack during the game. I followed Mom into the kitchen, feeling the delicious swish of petticoats as they moved around my legs, once again doubts about my situation momentarily receding into the background. I put on my apron, now understanding just how much more important aprons were for women and girls wearing flowing and delicate dresses and skirts, compared to men and boys in rougher clothing and pants that neatly stayed close to the body. We were busy preparing sandwiches when Mum stopped putting filling on the bread slices, looked deep in thought and asked, Jean seemed to like the feel of your dress honey. Do you think he may be interested in wearing dresses too? You could have a little sister to play with. I was horrified suddenly feeling the earlier level of disgust at my situation, knowing how close I was earlier in going back for more hypnosis and completely losing all sense of my true self like Jimmy did in the hospital. I realized that I was already losing myself for periods of time, where I was happy with my girlish situation. Now I was starting to feel worried for Jean. What to do? I answered, I don't think so mum, it was just new to him like it was new to me. No. That's not what I meant, it's just that it was a surprise for him and he acted without thinking. Out of instinct. I reflected that I was making it worse for Jean, not better. I didn't mean to, I was flustered. That's what I mean, Mum said, just like you're flustered now, the truth comes out when you don't have time to think and reflect. Maybe Jean could be persuaded, given enough exposure to girly things to be your sister. No, I don't think so, Mum. I think you're reading too much into this. Maybe I am, 
but tell me if he seems to be attracted to your clothes or seems to have girlish tendencies. Okay, mom, but I don't think that will happen, I replied. We finished the sandwich making and put drinks on trays and went back into the lounge, presenting the men with their refreshments. I noticed, Jean stealing glances at my skirt and legs, but thought that nothing was amiss as this was all new to him as it was to me. We served the snacks and retreated to the kitchen where I took off the apron and put it on the pantry door hook. I was looking at Jean when you were serving the sandwiches, Kelly. I think he is fascinated with your new feminine clothes, Mum observed. Reluctantly I replied that I noticed him looking but thought it was nothing but curiosity in a new situation. I think he sees how you like your new petticoats and how the petticoats move and the gentle swish they give. Heart newly pounding, I smiled, again hypersensitive to the delicious feel of them around my legs. Oh, I sighed, my petticoats do feel delicious around my smooth legs. In a dreamy fog I added, maybe he's wondering what he's missing. Then recovering somewhat, I stopped myself adding any more. That's what I thought and you confirmed it, Mum said with a mysterious smile. Chapter 7 Two Weeks Later I wished I didn't feel nauseous in the mornings. Mum told me that it would soon pass when my body got used to the medicine that came home with me from the hospital. Every morning Mum would come in and we would have a discussion over which slip or petticoat to wear under which dress for the day which always made me feel goosebumps. Today I was wearing my normal matching pink satin training bra and panties with a frou-frou petticoat that flared out under a cute sundress. I had on a garter belt and stockings and low-heeled court shoes. Mum had brushed my hair in the morning, styling it with large rollers and styling solution to give it body. I was getting used to putting on mascara and lipstick every day. Mum had told me that I didn't need any more makeup as I was young and my peaches and cream complexion didn't need anything more. I had settled into a routine, helping Mum with the housework in the mornings, mostly with meals, laundry and tidying the boys' bedrooms. I was starting to forget my opposition to a girl's life, as I really, really liked my petticoats. Whenever I wore them or thought of them, I would get goosebumps. It was mid-afternoon and I was relaxing after helping Mum prepare and put a roast with vegetables in the oven. I was reading a copy of Girl's Own when I heard Mum and Jean shouting at one another in the background. I listened, slowly the words becoming clearer. I don't know how they got under my pillow, I really don't. I heard Mum reply, well it seems to me you're too embarrassed to fess up with the truth. Now you will wear those panties since you seem to be fascinated by them. No. I won't, I can't. You can't make me. Jean responded. Well you can stay in your room and miss out on dinner unless you put them on, I heard. But I'm so hungry Mum, please don't make me. You heard me, now do it or miss out on dinner. The shouting stopped followed by Mum's footsteps coming into the lounge room where I was reading. She entered smiling at me. It seems you may have a sister after all, Kelly. I found some of your new panties under Jean's pillow. That seemed strange to me as I know that Jean had been out all day and Mum had been busy cleaning the bedrooms. As a new girl, I had been roped in to help clean up Jason's room. I had been dimly aware that Mum had gone into my room before cleaning up David and Jean's bedroom as well. Jean followed Mum out, hearing what was said shouted, I didn't steal your panties and hide them under my pillow and I don't want to wear them either. Now shush Jean, that was not a ladylike way to speak, Mum admonished. Mum, I'm not like Kelly, I'm not a girl. You're wearing nice silky pink panties aren't you? You must want to be a girl like Kelly here, Mum shot back. Jean's face turned red, arms held stiffly down, fists clenched, but he held in his anger and turned around. I'd rather be hungry than be turned into a girl like Kelly, Jean said as he turned around and went back to his room. I'm taking these horrid panties off and I won't be having dinner. After setting the table for our roast dinner, Mum and I were plating up the meat and vegetables when Jean quietly came into the kitchen. Mum turned to Jean, well have you changed your mind Jean, will you be having some dinner? It smells so wonderful. Can I please have some dinner too? Jean asked. Are you wearing your panties? Mom asked. No, well you better go to your room and put them on if you want some dinner, Mom demanded, looking stern. Okay, Mom, Jean said as he turned around and disappeared down the corridor. Mom turned to me and smiled. 
See Kelly, your little brother is really your sister at heart. I smiled, thinking that maybe Jean was a girl at heart. Jean was soon back in the kitchen and Mum checked to see that he was really wearing a pair of panties under his jeans. Oh good, Mum said, now don't they feel nice to wear? Jean looked a little surprised and finally admitted that they did. Well now that that is settled, I expect you to continue to wear them and look after them. You will have to hand wash your new panties and put them into your drawer, you're not returning them to Kelly here, she will be getting a new set of panties to replace the ones you stole. I will also get a new supply of panties for you too. I didn't steal anything, I don't know who put them under my pillow but it wasn't me. The heated reply woke in me my own opposition to being feminized. I had been lost in a new feminine world for almost two weeks with little thought to what was happening to me. I looked down with new awareness and horror about my own situation and how my boyish identity had been lost in petticoats. Now mom was working on Jean. Wasn't it bad enough she wanted to turn one of her sons into a girl? I wondered what could I do to stop this. Thinking of my own situation and how I had been maneuvered into wearing girls' clothes, how my boyish personality was almost lost to me, I grew as angry for Jean's new situation and frightened for him too. Soon Dad, Jason and David joined us as we sat down to the roast dinner that had just enticed Jean into wearing panties and given Mum the excuse to keep him in them. After the dinner dishes were washed and put away, Mum followed Jean to his room. I could hear them talking. Soon Mum and Jean were in the laundry and Mum was showing Jean how to hand wash his new, delicate panties. Mum returned to the lounge and sat down beside me on the couch. And shocked to find out that Jean was stealing your panties. I think we should take him to see Dr. Smythe to find out what is going on, don't you? No, Mum, don't do that, I said in shock. Don't do that. Maybe someone was pranking Jean, I don't think he put those panties there, he wasn't even home for most of the day, I replied. Well, I don't want to take a chance that he will be unhappy because he denied his desires when he was found out. I think it's best for him to go. Mom, please no. Don't do it, I don't think he's like that. Why are you so against it? Don't you like your petticoats? Haven't you accepted your feminine lifestyle, Kelly dear? I thought you'd be happy to have a sister also in petticoats to talk to, Mum said in a suspicious tone. Mum, I do love my petticoats. I love petticoats and dresses and all things feminine. And I want to share that wonderful girl time with you. I said with the intense feelings that I had just given myself with the trigger word. But I needed to deflect Mum from Jean and I thought if I could focus Mum's mind on me then there wouldn't be room for Jean. I'm new to all of this feminine world and I need to share it with only you. I'm not sure how I would feel if Jean had your attention too. It will just confuse things for me. Please mom, let us have this time together as mother and daughter. Mom's eyes softened and her face looked puzzled as she thought through my words. I looked at her with pleading eyes. Finally, I saw her face light up. Why darling Kelly, I can see that now. You want to spend the time with me, not Jean, and we can have more fun together. Yes, you are right, my girly girl. I would love to teach you all about being a girl, how to behave, dress, how we girls interact, what our interests are, she said, eyes beaming with pleasure. I smiled at Mum's words for Jean's sake and to turn Mum's mind away from him. To do that, I would become the girly girl Mum wanted all along. I thought I could strike while the iron was hot. How about we tell Jean that I just told you I was playing a prank on him, let him off the hook hey mum. That way there won't be any distractions when you introduce me to my feminine world. Mum looked at me for a moment, thinking. I held my breath while smiling encouragingly. She nodded, smiled and said, what a good idea. Getting him off the hook will keep him in line and leave more time for our mother, daughter time. However, now that he is wearing panties, let's just see if he keeps them on. Mum left and I overheard a relieved Jean thanking Mum for letting him of the hook, telling him that he need not wear the panties if he didn't want to. She soon walked back to me. Job done. Mum reported. Thank you Mum, now we can have the sort of relationship I've been longing for all this time. Oh darling. 
I'm so happy my girl is finally connecting with her true self. I think this is cause for celebration and if you want, we can accelerate your transition now that you are fully on board. Worriedly I asked, what do you have in mind mom? Well, those tablets from the hospital will help your body fit in better with being feminine, maybe we could up the dosage or get you back to the hospital to complete your transition to girlhood. Mom, can't we just take it slow and gentle, look, I'm already in dresses. Isn't that a lot of progress in such a short time? But if you truly want to be a girly girl, you should be looking forward to developing your figure. I can't really see why you want to delay, she said, her voice steadily rising. I knew this was getting out of the little control I had so far managed, I desperately thought of a way to calm her down. Oh mum, I do love being a girly girl, but I've hardly had time to adjust to it, I just want to explore things at my own pace. What are you saying? I don't believe it. What you are saying sounds like you made it up just to convince me not to continue helping you. How absurd. You are doing what you truly believe in your subconscious. That is what was what the doctors found out. They told me that if you denied your true feelings you would likely try to kill yourself again. I will not let that happen to you. Mom turned and left the room and into the kitchen where she was charging her phone. She stopped for a little then out the back door. I quietly walked into the kitchen and to the window. She had her phone in her hand talking agitatedly, pacing back and forth. I didn't know what she was going to do. Fearing she would still focus on Jean, I went to his room. He had just closed his dresser drawer and turned to look at me. Look at you in your pretty outfit. Did you do this to me, just to have a sister? You rat, get out of here, he yelled. Jean, Jean, I answered back, listen to me. I'm a victim more than you are. I would never put those panties under your pillow. Mum did it and I got her to stop doing these things to you. You heard what she said to you. All this clothing, my acting is not me. First mum made me do the same things she had you do before I went to the hospital. Now you are safe, so long as I focus her attention on me. Jean visibly relaxed and hearing what I'd said, truly understood that my sacrifice is what saved him. He looked worriedly at me and gave me a hug. Thank you Kelly, thank you so much. I don't know how to repay you. Just tell your brothers what I'm doing for you so they know that I really don't want this for myself, it's to help you. It will make it easier for me if they know and don't tease me. Sure thing Kelly, I'll tell them now. Jean stood up to leave but I held him back, I need to tell you something else. In the hospital, there's a ward where they turn boys into girls. They put me in there. They hypnotized me to think like and want to be a girl. Somehow they made me attracted to petticoats. You have to believe me. What are you saying? That's ridiculous. Why would they do that? But you've been acting girly since you came home. I've been trying to resist it but mom says a key word and the hypnosis pulls me back in. I don't know how, but it happened. While I was there, there was a boy they hypnotized. He was trying to fight it, he told me about what was going on but in the end he was hypnotized and he wanted to be a girl. I saw a boy come back from surgery to make him into a girl. It's happening and it's scary. Jean nodded, deep in thought. I heard the kitchen door shut and footsteps come into the house. Don't tell her what I told you. You have to stay true to yourself if she ever focuses on you again. I better go before she sees me talking to you. I slipped out of Jean's room and across the hall into my room. Mom seemed to be staying in the kitchen. That was all right for me but I was conscious that my great plan to fool Mum into thinking I was lost to a new feminine reality could be uncovered if I slipped up. I sat on my bed, tucking my skirts under me. I took stock of myself. Here I was dressed and made up like any young girl. Outwardly I was a girl, my hair, the minimal makeup I wore, the clothing, including two bumps on my chest where the bra was pushing my excess flesh into breasts and down to my hips now accented by my clothing, no sign of my genitals through thick layers of petticoat, shiver, and down to my smooth legs. I really looked and until moments ago with Jean, acted like the girl I seemed to be. I heard footsteps coming down the hall towards our rooms. Where would mom go I wondered and who was she talking to on the phone? My door opened. 
Mom walked into my room with a glass of cordial, she was smiling as she offered me the cold drink. Sorry darling, it's funny how things got out of control between us and of course, with Jean isn't it? We say and do things we don't mean. Here, you must be thirsty. Have a drink and we can talk more about becoming the girl you were meant to be. I was relieved at Mum's focus on me and took the drink, maybe Mum meant it and maybe Jean will be safe. I took a long drink to settle my frayed nerves. Mum smiled. Sure honey bun, we both know that you love being the girl you appear to be, don't you? It is nice Mum, I love the clothes, we've been having fun buying and trying them on, haven't we mummy? It was the first time I'd consciously used the word mummy, but I was trying to obliterate any thoughts of Jean being caught up in the feminine web I found myself in, smothered in new words, new ideas of my embracing my new role. That's good to hear dear, I know you do, and I know you want to be a more complete girl, the doctor told me so on the phone just now. Mum's voice faded as I started feeling very tired. Why was the room spinning? Chapter 8 Beep, Beep, Beep was that my alarm clock? My eyes were closed, but as consciousness rose, I could hear clattering, voices, footsteps. Are you awake, dear? I opened my eyes. With vision came the surprise that I was in a small hospital room. Looking to the side, I saw an four in my arm. Looking around, I saw a nurse looking towards me. Welcome back, dear. The operation is over. You just need to relax and recover now, she said. What? Where am I? What happened? The last two questions were redundant but my waking mind needed confirmation that I was in hospital, in the hospital I was desperately trying to avoid. You are in a recovery room. You were brought in by your mother, it seems you took an overdose of sleeping pills because you couldn't stand being a boy any longer. No, no, no I didn't. No. The nurse moved towards me, adjusting the force solution, adding a new fluid to the drip. It's no use denying it, when you came and we pumped your stomach, stabilized you and when the sleeping pills finally left your system, the emergency approvals and paperwork were completed. Your deep-seated wish to be a girl was granted. The rest was up to the surgeon. Now rest dear, the reason for your despair has been taken away. I faded back into oblivion. The next thing I knew, I was the very same ward I was in previously. The same array of beds, but I was on the other side of the ward, facing to where I was before. Then I wondered why I hurt in my chest and down below. I remembered what the nurse had said. The realization hit me that I had been turned into the girl I had feared becoming. No. No. I cried. Now shush, you'll disturb the other patients, a nearby nurse said. Deep rapid breathing, deep rapid breathing, I was hyperventilating. The pain in my chest increased. Now, now dear, shallow breathes, take shallow breaths. That's right, nice and slow. My breathing became slower, the dizziness was fading but the pain continued. That's it, just keep still. What is your level of pain between 0 and 10? It's about 6 I think. Good. That means the medication is doing its job, but you will need a little more to make you more comfortable. The nurse gave me two tablets and a glass of water which I happily accepted. She made sure I took the tablets then said, the doctor will be in to see you on his rounds. He can explain everything. The nurse turned and went to see other patients. I dozed off for a while then lazily thinking of my situation and last time I was here. Hearing hushed but urgent sounding voices, I opened my eyes to look at the others in the ward. There was a girl about 16 or 17 on the bed to my right. She was sitting up and reading a teen girl's magazine. The bed on my left was empty. Across the ward, there were three boys that looked worried or concerned. The boy across from me looked about 14, slightly built, had medium-length hair for a boy, just covering his ears. He was quietly crying. I could see that he had on a pink hospital gown. The boy next to him was a little older but more solidly built, also wearing a pink gown and looking very annoyed. I assumed it was his mother that was sitting next to him. As I focused on what they were saying, their voices became clearer. Now Brendan dear, I heard the woman say angrily, you were caught forcing yourself on Jody and just in time, otherwise you would have been in juvie by now. 
Just be thankful that you only have to undergo sensitivity training here for two weeks. Well, I don't like it one bit and I'll leave as soon as I can, he said fuming. Brendan, you will do no such thing. You know you have to cooperate. The doctor will only medicate you to calm you down, not eliminate your desires which you have demonstrated are far too strong for you. Then the good doctor will explain how your actions have affected others and she will find a way for you to understand how they felt when you pushed yourself onto them. But this is stupid, first I have this sissy hospital robe, then they pump me full with injections, I don't know what they'll do. You're just frightened, I can see it in your eyes. Just calm down, accept their advice and soon you'll be out of here, hopefully with a new viewpoint. And you will have escape being sent to Juvie, his mother said, trying to reassure him. I turned my attention to the furthest bed, again a boy, sleeping. He seemed effeminate, his head turned towards me. His eyes, what was it with his eyes? Then I realized that his eyebrows were plucked into feminine arches and his eyelashes looked too long and dark to be natural. I was distracted by the entry of Dr. Smythe into the ward. She was smiling and came straight over to my bed. She sat in the chair next to my bed, leaned over and said, Your mother rang me to say how you have shown your willingness to complete the transition, to take on a feminine role. So I told her how happy we're for you and what to all you still embraced your true femininity. There is no going back. You are evil, how dare you do this to me. I never wanted this but now I can't change it. You've trapped me in a prison of the wrong gender. How could you? I spat. Dr. Smythe looked amused at my outburst. I can speak to you openly now because you have a post-hypnotic suggestion that you cannot tell anyone what has happened to you. I knew when your mother rang that you couldn't have changed so quickly with so few sessions. There must have been some other reason she was convinced you were now so wholeheartedly wanting to be all the girl you could be. So I took advantage of the situation and here we are. And once I put you under again, you will be happy to be a girl for your mother and forget we had this conversation. What are you talking about you bitch? I tried to yell but could only whisper. Hypnotic suggestion? Do you think you are the only patient? No your mother is being treated here as well. She is the one I'm treating through you. She was on the verge of a permanent breakdown when your father brought her to me. She had been increasingly distressed that she could not have a daughter. She was on the verge of dangerous chronic depression. To prevent her from being committed to a mental facility, your father and I decided to save her by giving her what she needed, a daughter. Having four sons, we had to decide who could be sacrificed to save her. After all, wouldn't you make the sacrifice to save your mother from breakdown? But I wasn't asked, I objected. But you just about volunteered yourself when you offered to help your mother in the kitchen. That is what saved your father and myself from having to choose. You did it yourself. Now sleep. A click of fingers was the last thing I heard. Chapter 9 I woke refreshed, and with less pain than I had the day before. I was happy that I had had the operation, even though I had a strange unsettling feeling. I tried to ignore it while I looked under the bed covers at my chest. Yes, there were delicious lumps where they should be. I was so happy seeing them. My hands wandered down my body, feeling a bandaged groin area. A nurse came in to see me. She was pushing a small trolley and as she came next to the bed, pushed the curtains across so I could have some privacy. I'm here to change your bandages, she told me, it's going to be delicate the first time but will get better progressively after that. I held my breath, knowing it would be painful but necessary. During the process, I got to see that I had on a stiff and bulky brassiere but very small sticks were near my hairless armpits. I couldn't see further down but knew the nurse's ministrations were gentle, strange, yet painful. I was relieved when she had finished. I lay in bed thinking wonderful thoughts about how I had achieved my dream. I opened my half-closed eyes when I heard a commotion across the ward. I saw Brendan had pulled out his fore and was trying to reach his clothing drawer. The nurse had caught him and was gently trying to convince him to get back into bed. What confused me was that I heard that he knew others were being hypnotized to accept their changes and that he wasn't going to be one of them. The nurse tried to calm him but eventually she called for another nurse to inject him with a tranquilizer. 
Once completed and Brendan was back in bed sleeping soundly, the nurse looked around to see who had witnessed his outburst. I feigned being asleep but the boy next to Brendan was wide awake and looking worried. What was he saying? he asked. The nurse cut him off and said there was nothing to worry about and he also received an injection. Soon the two sleeping boys were wheeled out down the corridor. It was about two or three hours later that they came back, smiling like they had just been to the ice cream parlor. After the nurses left, Brendan asked Tony if he liked to dance. Oh yes, Brenda, I would love to dance with a hunky young man. I would get mum to buy me a super neat dress and high heels. I'd have to practice though, I've never worn them before. Tony was waving his arms around as he expressed his emotions in a feminine manner. Oh me too, replied Brenda. I saw a dreamy dress in the latest magazine that I would love to have. Confronted with such rapid changes in attitude, I again questioned my own attitude. Had I been hypnotized to think that I wanted to be a girl? I thought of my body, now that it was complete, I smiled, I was happy. My heart said, don't worry, be happy, but my mind knew something was wrong and a niggle of doubt invaded my thoughts. While recovering on the second day after the operation, I was quite happy with my progress and I was impatient, waiting for the time that I would be able to see the whole of my body. A nurse soon came into the ward, closed the curtains around my bed and began to explain about the need to keep my new vagina open and the use of a dilator. I could see what had been done to my nether regions. I knew what to expect and although I was apprehensive, another part of the welcomed the change. To finally be a girl in body that matched my desire, niggle. The nurse carefully removed the bandages and I could finally see that I was flat down there, my male genitals were gone but I couldn't see anything else, just a shaven mound, then empty space between my legs. The nurse noticed me peering down there. Don't worry dear, from your angle you can't see anything, it's a normal part of being a girl, she said with a look of concern. Oh yes, it will take getting used to, I replied, not wanting her to send me back to Dr. Smythe. I was introduced to the dilator which looked a little like a candle. I had to gently insert it into my new vagina four times a day. It felt strange and more than a little sore if the pain medications were wearing out. However, it really brought home to me that I was no longer a boy but a girl. I saw Dr. Smythe at the end of the first week after the operation. She was so nice and I felt so happy and relaxed after my visits with her. But for some reason, a niggle of doubt and suspicion persisted. I was careful by nature so I did not let anyone know of the state of my mind. Hello there Kelly, how are you feeling about going home as a beautiful girl? Oh doctor, I love my new body, I can't wait to be on my feet and start living a new feminine life like I was meant to, I said, wanting to avoid another hypnosis session. Good, girl, I'm glad you are happy with your transition. She paused for a moment, looking down as if thinking deeply. It seemed I had escaped the hypnosis session that would mess with my own self-awareness of what has happened to me. Then she finally looked up and smiled. Your mommy tells me that Jean is very interested in the changes you have made. What do you think of that? She asked. I couldn't help gasping and I know I looked surprised, maybe even worried. Were they going to rope in Jean as well? No, they couldn't. Not after all I have sacrificed. I couldn't speak, my mouth was dry. Dr. Smythe raised her fingers, ready to click them. Next thing I knew, I was calm and happy again while the good doctor was writing down some notes. I reflected, Jean wants to be a girl too, how grand, I'll have a sister. I couldn't wait to encourage him to explore my new, wonderful feminine world. Chapter 10 Mum arrived around midday and brought a change of clothes for my return home. The outfit of a beautiful sundress with the accompanying lingerie made me happy to be immersing myself into the feminine world as a real girl. We arrived home, still finding it hard to walk. I shuffled to my room and lay down on the bed, on top of the covers. Mum told me that Jean had been a great help in my absence. He would be in soon to bring me refreshments. The door opened and in walked Jean, a floral apron tied around his waist. He was still wearing his normal boy clothes but what looked like a plain blouse. He was carrying a tray with a glass of milk on a doily and some cookies on a plate. He came near, eyes down, not wanting to see what had happened to me, 
or maybe for me to see what had happened to him. As he set the tray down across my legs, I caught sight of his pink nail polish and sensed a hint of lavender perfume. Hi, Jean. My mom tells me you've been a great help. Mom needed someone to help while you were gone, he replied. I see that she's, um, prettied up your appearance. Are you happy with what she's done? Jean gave me a shy look. No, I'm not sure. She's been on to me ever since you left. First she told me that I would be helping in the kitchen, then I had to wear an apron. Then she had me in the laundry hand-washing delicates. That was all the excuse she needed to insist that I need a manicure to avoid runs in the delicates. When she finished the filing, she then put on this horrid pink nail varnish. I can't bear that others can see them. Is that all of it or is there something else? I asked. Jean blushed and said, she also makes me wear panties and camisoles under my outer clothes. It's so embarrassing. My undies drawer is half filled with girlish underwear and mom has thrown out half my boy's underwear. I was disappointed by Jean's attitude. Couldn't he see it was so nice wearing pretty, soft feminine clothing? It's not that bad, Jean. When mom showed me how nice these clothes were, I realized it was a good opportunity to see what it's like to wear such wonderful clothes. Most boys don't get such a chance. I said smiling. But it looks like mom wants me to go further. I don't know, it's not right and each day it seems there are more demands. Jean replied looking miserable. I could see he was half-hearted about these changes, making me sad that he didn't want to fully explore his feminine side. I'll talk to mom, maybe I can change her mind and slow down on you. Jean smiled, I'd like that, but the last time you tried, you were taken away and finally turned into a real girl. Jean provided the key to remembering what had happened, breaking the delusion I was under. I picked up my glass of milk and cookies, satisfied I'd calmed him down but troubled that I had failed to help last time and at great cost to me. I thought I could try a different approach to mum. Jean left in a happier mood that when he came in, promising to get mum to talk to me. Good, I could talk to mum about Jean. I'd just finished my cookies when mum came in to see me. Jean told me that you wanted to talk to me. What is it, honey? Jean told me he unsure about the fact that you're making him wear his new lingerie. Mom looked at me, concerned, wondering what my attitude was to Jean's reluctance. Maybe you could talk to him about how you just love your petticoats. Petticoats are just so scrummy to wear. Don't you think so, dear? A shiver ran down my spine. Oh, my petticoats, how I love my petticoats, I thought as I was lost in nice warm feminine feelings. I would love a little sister and I can see great potential in Jean, he would look so cute as a girl, especially in lovely pink petticoats, I added. Mom smiled. That's what I think too. I'm so happy you're so open to this honey. I shook my head, but he's resisting you now so that's no good, we need a gentler approach. I promised him I'd talk to you to slow down the changes. I don't want to lie to him, just gently encourage him to accept his feminine fate. I just need time with him to convince him that wearing lingerie is not so bad, and actually should be enjoyed. Once that is done, we can move him a little further along the path. Mom smiled at me. Oh darling, how wonderful to have you with me on this. Jean will be Jean in no time. I smiled too thinking that I would love to have a sister to talk to. Boys can be so crass and boring sometimes. Mom left the room with the tray while I lay down for a rest. Next day came with the sun beaming into my room. I had a wonderful sleep. I could tell that the morning rush had come and gone, it was too quiet. I must have slept well past breakfast time. I soon heard footsteps coming closer so I sat up in bed, arranging my pretty pink nightie around me. The door opened. It was Jean, half in the doorway, still wearing his pretty apron but I immediately spied the little ruffles on the collar of what looked like a pale yellow blouse and short purple velvet shorts. He looked abashed as he saw me staring at him. He was carrying a breakfast tray with steaming oatmeal and orange juice. Come in Jean, you look so pretty in that lovely blouse and shorts, let me have a look. Coming fully into the room, he came closer to the bed. Turn around so I can see, I said enthusiastically. 
He put down the tray on the bedside table then turned around, saying, But I'm so confused, I like how it feels and mom asks so encouraging, but I'm a boy and I'm supposed to hate it. Mom stepped up her campaign to change me. I noticed as he turned around for me that he was also wearing dainty ruffle-edged yellow socks and Mary Jane shoes with a two-inch heel. Now, Jean, calm down, settle your emotions so you can think clearly, I pleaded. Jean stepped forward and sat on the edge of the bed, downcast, looking confused. Now don't worry, Jean, I'm sure once I'm fully recovered, Mom will want me back helping her and you can get on with being free to do what you want. He looked up, eyes widening, looking for signs of hope. Do you think so, Kelly? I know so. So in the meantime, just play it cool, go with the flow and don't upset Mom. You never know, you may like wearing these clothes. They suit you. Don't say that, Kelly, you're a girl now so you've nothing to lose, but I do. You are right, but also I can relax in these wonderful clothes. Don't they at least feel nice to wear? Now be honest. I suppose they do feel nice and soft compared to my normal boy clothes, but... No buts, there's your answer. Explore it while you can, while I'm still recovering, you'll be out of them soon and you'll miss a great opportunity that most boys don't have. You might even enjoy going one step further and putting on a petticoat, shiver, and a dress like me. Jean looked dubious but after a while, a look of resolve crossed his features. Okay, no harm in going with the flow, after all, you'll soon be back on your feet, and I'll be back to my normal wear. A smile gradually formed on his lips. That's the spirit, Jean. By the way, how have Jason and David reacted to your change in clothing? They don't say anything. I think that they fear if they do then they will be next. Tosh. They don't have anything to worry about. You can tell them. You're just replacing me until I'm up and about. Tell them that. I suggested to Jean. Jean smiled, getting more confident and less concerned about his own situation. I will tell them right now, he smiled. In the meantime, don't let your oatmeal get cold and gluggy. He then left me to my breakfast. I felt that my approach was working and I'd have a sister before too long. Twinge. What was I thinking? Jean to be a sister? Why did that cause me some concern? After all, I was happy being a girl, wasn't I? There was something in the back of my mind that I couldn't quite grasp, an unsettling feeling. I concentrated. Me, a girl, me a girl, coming closer, me a girl, me a. Oh my! I'm a girl, I've had the operation hastened by me wanting to protect Jean in the first place. My eyes widened as I realized it was all for nothing and I felt my mind came out of a fog it had been in. Now mom wants the same for Jean. I was horrified that this could be happening to Jean so soon after I had reached the ultimate in feminization. Was mom mad? She already had me where she wanted me, as her daughter. Why did she want Jean to be a girl too? For that matter, why was I wanting him to be a girl, encouraging him to go further and wear petticoats and dresses? Think, think, something is really wrong. Of course, now I remember, I've been hypnotized by Dr. Smythe. I must have been under her influence for longer each time she hypnotizes me. I know it's me under her influence, but it's not me, not my natural attitudes anyway. And where was Dad in all of this? I had to find out from Jean so I called out for him. Jean entered the room to collect the breakfast things, he was still in his girlish clothes and apron. I had to know straight away so I launched into questioning him. What did dad say when mom started treating you like that? I asked. He said that I should be a good boy, do what she says and help mom. He said that she was still fragile and while you were away, I had to fill in for you. I was aghast at what dad had said, I hoped that mom would drop Jean's feminization. I will try and stop this happening to you then Jean. It was hard for me to avoid and I didn't succeed, maybe together we can convince mom to stop her feminizing ways with you. Thank you Kelly, but like you said earlier, maybe I could take advantage of the situation and try on a dress or two, just TC and feel what it's like, after all, you just love your petticoats and dresses, Jean said as he turned and left the room. I sat on the bed, thinking while drinking my milk, what can I do? 
Mom was a force of nature when it came to feminizing me and now Jean was in her sights, and he seemed to be falling for it. It didn't help that I was all over the place, alternately under Dr. Smythe's influence only to emerge sometime later when reminded somehow of the real situation. It seemed though that I was more content being a girl, helping Jean seemed to take my mind off my own situation. I must have dozed off for a while for I was woken by the sound of my bedroom door opening. I looked around and saw Jean walking with Mom behind him. His longish hair was styled in a pageboy style with a hair clasp holding back hair off his forehead. His lips showed signs of pink lip gloss. He was smiling and swishing his new dress around, Mum beaming. He sashayed over to me and hugged me. I could smell a floral fragrance. I was dumbfounded. How did he change so quickly? I told Mum I'd like to try on a petticoat and dress and she loved the idea. And when I finally did try it on, I just loved it. Oh, thank you for suggesting it, Kelly. I really love it he said. Smiling, Mum joined in, Kelly, you're a wonder, I knew Jean was a girl inside and you helped unlock her true self. Look how she loves her petticoats and dress. Thrum. Oh, what a beautiful petticoat and dress you have on Jean, I just love it, I replied happy to finally have a sister, entirely forgetting that I was a reluctant girl myself.